Welcome to episode cool. seven of the Tap Haven podcast. Okay, now really this is like take 15, by the way, for anybody watching. Way to exaggerate. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, not that bad at this. <laughs> So so once again, how are the how are the holidays? It's it's cold as we were discussing. Yeah, yes, uh, my dog got their first real snow with snow dogs, and they uh, went nuts. I can imagine. Man. Like oh, this is where this is where we live, right? This, this is what this it's is like. It? One of my dogs <laughs> will never catch a ball. He will never catch anything but a treat. But he will also catch a snowball. Oh. He will jump. He will jump with both feet off the ground just to catch a snowball incredible wow Robert. That, it that's that crazy. big of a deal for this guy <laughs> that's funny i'll say that other than the freeze it's pretty yeah. great um thankfully no burst pipes over here um mm, very lucky uh, we spent the entire uh days off literally doing nothing so power nice. didn't go out water was still there so very excited that it was a very low-key end of the winter hol- holiday break i will say the holiday break itself was good but exhausting i'm so I, tired I can, I, can, I can imagine i can imagine <laughs> it was very tiring for me too and then so yesterday we actually went uh, snowboarding and on the way there, the oh, roads nice. were pretty bad in certain places, and we were like sliding oh, off geez. the road a bit, but didn't quite go off. And then uh, we get there, and then there's a 45 minute uh, line of cars because yeah. the lot is like full. And uh, they let us in because I was like, I really got to pee, so can I just go to the lot two where the bathroom is? Because this is bad. And he's like, Yeah, yeah, it's fine. There's a miraculous parking spot, like, right next to the bathroom that a oh, yes. attendant puts us in, right? We go to the bathroom. We're back to the car in five minutes. There's a car behind us, a truck in front of us. The person who parked us in behind us is gone. The guy in the truck is there. Exchange information. He's a great guy. He's like, please, just, could you just call me, and I'll come move the truck, and, and uh, you know, I just don't want to get towed. I'm like, yeah, yeah. No. Then a Jeep parks him in while we're there. He gets the Jeep information. Then we're going and doing our thing for two hours. Out of the four hours we're supposed to do it. Then we're like, you know what? I think we're done. It's like negative three degrees. It is cold. And we get back to the car. Or actually, no, we talked to the guy on the phone ahead of time. He's like, you know, um, another truck parked me in and I have no idea who it is. (sighs) The ski resort will not tow anybody. Which no. Is and so we're running around with our heads cut off because the dogs are home alone. Oh, die, God. Obviously. And, you know, we're just going back to the car after we we're defeated. And the cool guy chases there with the truck. And he's like, hey, man, the guy showed up and I got him to move his car out of your way. And I was like, what? Awesome. And so we were able to get out and the the guy was there and we just got really lucky because his whole family was on the mountain and he said that uh he took a nasty spill so he was just getting ready to go back up and i was just like oh Ooh, that's karma for parking us in in less than five minutes and leaving it's crazy <laughs> what a sloppy bastard yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe was it busier than like when we went it was it was in it, every parking spot was taken. It was a hundred percent full. Um, it wasn't as busy in a way, but it, but at the same time, it was. It was weird. I think it's because people couldn't stand being on the mountain because of how cold it was. But they got like twenty four, maybe thirty six inches of snow Jeez. over the past week, and so it was really good conditions. Like when you're walking on the snow you were falling in like six inches or so. Wow. That's awesome. Wow. That's a lot of coverage. Awesome. So the mountain was pretty decent, but the uh, <laughs> parking lot was not. I can imagine. Jesus. And I, I can't wait. I have my board. I'll be going to visit him next month, hopefully, to also get some snowboarding in. Enjoy, oh, yeah. friends. Enjoy. Yes. <laughs> Negative three degrees. No. Absolutely not. Yeah, I learned. I usually go with just like a t-shirt, like a moisture wicking t-shirt and Under Armour Bro. under clothes. Not that was a mistake. No, it was good. We did cold 
like that mountain. Welcome, that. welcome to Robot <laughs> Anthony. Nice. I'm back. Hi. Nerd. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good times, except for the parking lot. Yeah, sick. Yeah, I feel like once it gets right around freezing, or like when you're in the mid twenties, as long as the feels like is right around there too, I I get warm while I'm snowboarding. Mm. Yeah. Once it gets below about fifteen, ten. That's the switch yeah, no. oh. at which you need. That's when you have the full face covering. You need everything in that condition. Because you're going to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. I had hand warmers and brand new gloves and my mm-hmm. fingers were free. Mm-hmm. And when you reach sentience, like, what was that like? Sentience? Yeah. Because you're a robot. Yeah. You, your AI is fully like, met, yeah. like, <laughs> culminated in this consciousness i just wanted to know what was it like to realize uh mortality you know <laughs> we have our own sentient uh, whiskey I, bot over here <laughs> I, I thought i was thought i was mortal for a moment but then i realized no i'm still mortal. yeah it's see? just feeling yeah see the robot got, came back out just, just for that part <laughs> uh, feeling but oh man, my god no so man, we have we have some uh, a fun year ahead of us. This is the first episode of the year, but we have a pretty mm-hmm. fun year. We have, gosh, what at least forty different whiskeys lined up and ready at to least. go. I don't even want for to count, different honestly. episodes. So yeah. it, it's going to be an awesome year, or the first full year of the Tap Haven podcast, and we're going to start it off with probably one of the more interesting whiskeys. Because I, I, I don't think that Australia is known for whiskeys. Mm, nope. Poisonous animals? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Poisonous animals. Yer- yerba mate? No, they're not yerba mate. I don't, what is it? Yerba mate? I don't think so. What's the thing that like they put on toast that's absolutely disgusting? Oh, I don't know. Aussies. Tell us in the Aussies, comments. They like, they, what, they, what is they this? They love it, and I've tried it, and it's... You know, it's like an acquired taste. I'll say that it's an acquired taste, but oh. it is definitely something that they, it's like one of these uh, condiments synonymous with Australia. Interesting. Ve- Vegemite. Yes, that's it. Vegemite. <laughs> what what is Vegemite? Vegemite is like a paste that they put on toast. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about a condiment that the Australians yeah. like. Anyway, back oh, to the podcast. wait a second, wait a second. But this is <laughs> this is this is great. We're gonna have to try this for the podcast. No, no, I my dude, it is it is Australian food spread made from leftover brewer's yeast. I did not know that. With and various vegetable hard. and spice additives. Ah oh, shit! I, of course I brought it up. Of course I brought it up. No, it's fine. Okay, okay cool. Well, yeah, on our fine. on our first uh, in person podcast, where all three of us we'll are together, it. we'll have we're Vegemite. gonna have Vegemite <laughs> toast with a whiskey, oh, and it's gonna be fine. amazing, amazing. Oh, it, if we do this around March or September, and in Atlanta, I think it's like the third weekend or so, the early part of the month. I might uh, be able to get an Australian to provide us with authentic. Oh my gosh! Oh. And and I think we have a day that where we're already trying to plan Atlanta stuff. So that in person episode might be in June. Mm-hmm. Everybody's if everybody's able. Yep. Uh, that that, that could be a lot of fun. Be good. Yep. But back to the bill. My yeah. Guy. So we we have a wonderful Star Wars Nova. Uh, single malt whiskey. It's an Australian whiskey. Um, now the age statement on this is two years, so it, it could have two years. Now, for a single malt whiskey, of course, this means that the mash bill is a hundred percent malted barley. However, the interesting thing about this one is that they um, let this whiskey mature in red wine barrels. Hmm. And so I'm thinking that 
this is going to be a pretty interesting whiskey here. Now, one Australian whiskey. However, and to kind of <laughs> okay. I, I like I can't get the lid off. Buddy. Oh. Keep I think it's my out Eric soliloquies, bud. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, I because it's in Australia. I don't. I I've never had an Australian whiskey. I don't know how we're gonna. What kind of flavor palette they usually prefer, or what we're looking at here. But just given the single malt nature of this, um, I think we're gonna get a little bit lighter of a whiskey. It's a little bit low on the ABV. We're looking at about 82 proof or uh, um, uh, 41% ABV. So it has been proofed down. And okay. Anthony almost has the top off here. He's almost. Oh, got thank it. God. There you go, bud. So, and it I didn't, it was going to explode. And it didn't break. I thought um, it was good. We definitely I'm have a. By the low ABV on this. Well, yeah. Now they have some single barrels which might be interesting. interesting to try from them. But I also think we're going to get a really sweet whiskey here. Like, I can yeah. already get the red wine. Almost, almost cabby. Yeah, it has like a cabby, cabernet smell. A little bit of that almost um, scotch peatiness on top from the, the single malt. A little bit of barley. It kind of smells mm -hmm. scotchish. Mm -hmm. And it, it's got a really nice, like, rose, almost a rose wood color, right? It's got, like, a little say, bit of pink to it. It's got a dark it. amber. Yeah. With a little bit of yellow to it. Yeah. It's pretty. Pretty viscous, too. All right, here we go. Down the hash, boys. Oh, it just smells like fruit juice. Wow, that's interesting. First things I'm getting are I'm, I'm getting a little bit of that scotchy style of flavor. The single malt is definitely forward, mm -hmm. but it's very sweet. Very squat. Very scotchy. Yeah. You that, get, entire, that entire first experience was pretty much an Irish whiskey. Mm. I, I don't know. I get a lot of the barley. This definitely has more of a single like the single malt flavor is a hundred percent there with a a lot of the 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 almost cognac flavors of a wine if you, if you were to describe the barley taste to somebody who is a simpleton at this what would you explain it as mm. what what other fo foods have the barley taste in them or the smell or essence of that they can compare it to it's almost um I would say it's almost nutty. Like it's almost got like a a baking uh like savory nut flavor. Mm. Like a like a a a bread that's been baked like had nuts baked in, like a multigrain nutty bread type of deal. Hmm. It doesn't stick around for me long enough to give me like a, a definitive taste. To be I honest, could, I could see that it 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 passes very quickly. It's there and gone. Yeah, yeah, it's a very. However, I will say there is nothing harsh about this whiskey. Um, this is a very Fair. easy drinker. I feel, mm -hmm. Anthony. Anthony, your face says you everything have... was harsh about this whiskey. Easy drink, not harsh, very light. This is shit. Oh, oh, wow. He went. Oh, <laughs> he's out of out of oh. here. So he wait, what? It doesn't out. have any flavor. It tastes just sharp and annoying. Hmm. Oh, sharp and annoying. From so the, there's from just the this like baby bitter new nu nuisance. It's just like it's like oh you you smell so good. Oh yes, let's go out on a date. Oh yeah. Ooh, let me uh. Let me taste you a little bit. Mmm. No, no. Oh my God, you taste so bad. But then afterwards, you're like, I really like that date. It was great because the aftertaste is like the feeling is good. So it smells good. It feels good, and it tastes bad. Hmm. 
Now, how many how many other single malts have you had, Anthony? I can't recall, hmm. but I know I've had them. Yeah, oh. and I think I've possibly always had that weird feel. I mean, maybe is that malt? Is that what? I don't know what that taste is. Malted barley. Yeah. yeah. That malted, might be the problem. Because, malted barley uh, has a distinctive taste, for sure. Is barley... Barley's what you, barley isn't in beer, right? It is in beer. They, they can't have barley in beer. Depends. Um, it just depends it, on the mash bill. And so... And so a lot of beers I'm, will use barley. Interesting. But, um... But yeah, I I can see what you're saying. It, it is very, it's very much a single malt. There's um, just like no flavor. I I think that has to do with the low age that we're talking about. Like a two year single malt is doesn't have a lot of time in that barrel. I think a lot of the flavor that you're getting here is actually from aging in wine barrels. It's just wine. It has a cognac flavor. It, it's almost as if I mixed a super low age I single malt yeah. with a light cognac. Mm -hmm. I um, can see that. However, the more we drink this, the more I'm, very, I'm left very uninspired. I can right? see that. I see a lot of yeah. potential for this flavor, but it needs more maturation. It needs more time. And I feel like this is a running theme with what we've kind of pulled from Flaviar so far. Agreed. With a lot of the things that, that we've that we've pulled from them, there is a lot of good happening, but it not needs enough time. More time, not yeah. enough time. I can see that all of all of the things that we've gotten from Flaviar have been two four year whiskeys, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think those are really nice or kind of like a first step into the mm -hmm. whiskey genre because i would argue nothing that we've had was really offensive even if it was uninspiring and maybe uh anthony this has a close. more this is close though eric this is close i i, you think I see so? where you're going i see where you're going and saying that like everything that we've picked up has been kind of like starter friendly get that yeah this is pretty close to me being like if i wanted to have alcohol I would rather it taste at least somewhat interesting, rather not not just not good, but somewhat interesting than this. Because I can see that other than, other than what you see on this label for the red wine barrels, in that it's a um, it has an ABV of uh, sorry, yeah, ABV of forty one percent. It's not giving me really much anything else. I can see now. That. I do need to bring up, of course, and highlight. Especially for myself, that is not a bourbon. It is a whiskey. It is a whiskey. Yes, it is and not a bourbon. So actually, if I think about it from that way, it is a really good whiskey because whiskey is usually really bad. Like it's really harsh. It can be. Is that whiskey? You don't just drink whiskey usually. You drink bourbon. Whiskey you can gets whiskey things. Though. You can. Some of them are good enough, but there's. I think a majority of just whiskeys that are young mm -hmm. aren't that flavorful. They're just, they're like a, you add them to a drink, you know, you, you mix them into something. Got you. Bourbons are, are, if a bourbon can't stand on its own, it's, it's a really bad bourbon. Like they're supposed to be, <laughs> they're supposed to be drank by themselves. So I think I've there definitely is many worse whiskeys. Like this is better than Jack Daniels by far. Oh, by far. Yes. Yeah, so I, I could. I I think though there is a difference between because we got to remember whiskey is the over encompassing, uh, flagship for everything else. So like bourbon's a whiskey, scotch is a whiskey, Japanese whiskey. Yeah, they all fall yeah. under this umbrella, and they all have different qualities to them. And mm -hmm. I I think the one thing I would say if you like single malt whiskeys in general. But you want something that's a little lighter and a little bit sweeter, but you like the flavor of single malt whiskeys, this might be right up your alley. Let me see if more would be better. Maybe oh my god, guys, no wonder. Well, sorry if I missed sorry, I'm sure Eric mentioned this before, but the barrels are steamed, not charred. They are oh. steamed barrels. And I, I, I was actually going to talk a little bit about this. So 
there are some interesting things about this company that make okay make me want to look at kind of like how they're going yeah (laughs) like how they're doing here so essentially (laughs) david vitale i i'm hoping i pronounce that correctly david vitale he was he was the star wars distillery founder and essentially his goal was to make a like australian whiskey company and back when he first started it really you had like these super primo whiskeys in australia but that's about it they didn't it it was a lot of money to import whiskeys into australia and so his goal and vision was to create this distillery for australia to make affordable whiskey affordable good whiskey in australia importing it from uh, scotland for scotches and things like that was enormously expensive and so where we could get a scotch here, it was pretty good for like 70, 80 bucks, right? Or if you, you know, you go to Scotland and you can get one for even cheaper than that sometimes, it is really good. And that you were paying a premium in Australia for these good whiskeys. Mm-hmm. And so he wanted to kind of get an approachable, affordable Australian whiskey. And, and that's kind of his tagline, affordable and approachable. Mm. Um. And so he went, went about to create what we have here. Now, this is the Nova line. They have a bunch of other whiskeys that um, they have. So they have ones that are peated finish. They have single barrels, right, that are what we higher here. in ABV. No, we don't have a single barrel here. This is a single? Oh, this is a single malt. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, this sorry, is sorry. a single malt. And so they have the Nova single malt. They have one up above that that's kind of the Solera single malt. And they have the octave barrels. They have some single barrels. Mm-hmm. And so they have a bunch of options and interesting things um, about them that they have going for them. But the Nova in particular, if you read uh, the back, the Australian wineries give them their barrels. They then steam those barrels to retain the penetration of wine into the wood. And this particular Nova line is to kind of highlight those wine flavors. Wait. So... Which barrels are steamed? All of them? Are there no charred barrels? Because there's two I types of barrels, know. right? I do not believe so that n- these barrels are charred. Nova is only using steamed wine barrels. Because you have to remember, w- bourbon is the only one that requires charred, charred. American white so oaks at the barrels. Yeah, it's a, a one-barrel life. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not a. It's not two barrels. It's, it's not a finishing, barrel. right? Interesting. They're aging it in steam in the wine, wine barrel. barrels. Is steaming common for wine? Um, I don't I have to say no. I don't think that, that is that the would case. Burn off, I think that would burn off a lot of what some would say the root taste of the barrel itself possibly now, and how i will say I some of them do yeah. steam them like it isn't an uncommon practice but i don't think it's like it's not a rare practice and it's not a like the overall practice it's just some of them steam them some of them char them um i think a lot of wines end up steaming more so than like whiskeys but whiskeys oftentimes char their barrels I've never heard of a winery steaming a barrel, though. Like when I think when I think wine and if I'm like if I'm in wine country in Italy. Well, I think they they steam they steam clean them barrels. I think they steam clean most of their barrels. I'm not I'm not 100 percent. You're you're probably right. No, they They don't. They don't char wine barrels as far as I know. In every case. Let me see this. Let's do this right, right quick. Yeah, they no, they actually, don't typically yeah, yeah. char wine barrels. That that I believe. I don't believe though that wine then steams their barrels during the fermentation process or th- during the storage process. No, 
So I think the use of the steaming of the barrel with this whiskey is used as a replacement of the char process inside of oh a hundred percent whiskey domain, which yeah. I'm like, it's an interesting take because you can say that you're like drawing out the uh, essence of the wine without causing damage to the wood and possibly uh, causing deviations within the taste. But I think it's it's a catch tw- uh, twenty two. Is it 22? I've yeah, had two shots, 22. so this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, d- I definitely think it takes away the vanilla, caramel, yes, like notes that you usually get from a and charred I, barrel that might improve this flavor palette. I think it needs to be warmer. I, I do think I can that, see that like I can see that. that aspect of the vanilla, or at least maybe like some of like maybe some brown sugar aspect to it to add some form of like uh, no not malted I guess a warmer uh, sugar texture in any way to this taste would probably make it a lot better in my in my opinion I I like um, I like bourbons and or whiskeys like let's just put it on, on an umbrella that are one juicy but also too warm and this is warm without the juice. So, what would you rate it? Nat? What did he say? What did we say? Undrinkable was three. Um. Now that I, I I don't know. I would. I think the way I would put it is that five is your average, like your average good whiskey so okay anything above a five is like this is better than average this is something that i'm going out of my way for so like six and seven are like hey these are my daily drinkers these are my Mm -hmm. i'm going out of my way to get these eights and nines are like these are the creme de la creme yeah i'm i'm going into stores hoping that i find these and then 10 is like this is my perfect whiskey. This is my number Got it. one. Got right. it. This is a four, a flat four. Okay. This is a flat four. I would not buy this as a daily driver because there's not enough for me to pick it up and say that I'm going to enjoy the flavor. I would say that the maker's mark that we had is something closer to what, what I would constitute to at least a five. Whereas like I could pick it up and be like, oh, that was an interesting little experience I had. Let me go about my way. I yeah. would not pick this up if I wanted to have a daily experience with it. Gotcha. Anthony? I was going to say four as well. Um, it's not like super bad, but it's definitely, I don't know. If, if it was available, it's very unlikely that it would be my choice. If it was the only thing available, then four. But like, if I saw it on the shelf, I'd be like, "Oh, I've 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 seen that before." But uh, I'll pass. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, the yeah. best thing about it is the mouth feel. It's very long and lingering if you're paying attention to it. But I don't know. It's also like one thing to think about is um, if you're drinking at all to get like a little bit of a buzz or something like that. The it's forty one percent alcohol. It is very lightweight which means it's more expensive if that's yep. something that you care about because i just had a 130 proof single barrel that probably cost less than this and especially proportionally when oh that's that? that's a good question when did you have that there bud that was on the mountain yesterday oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> nice. that was a that was a Jack Daniels single barrel rye that Eric pointed out to me. He said it was like the only good Jack Daniels, which he's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> single the the, the, the Jack Daniels. So uh, just to be clear, the Jack Daniels has a huge line. Jack Daniels is obviously really famous. They have their low end whiskey that is their main seller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they also have good whiskey. It's just harder to find. You got to go for their single barrels. You got to go for their more small batch stuff. And they're not that's because most, 
Yeah, most of their they are a subsidiary of the Coca Cola company. Okay, most of their yeah. stuff is supposed to go in Jack and Coke. Yep, and it's yep. slightly different Jack and Coke. Yep. Oh, this Jack and Coke is with that kind of Jack, and it tastes different. And I bet that's a great experience. And that's why they all taste bad by themselves. Yeah, which is why I brought up that you know a whiskey is often thought of as a mixer. Earlier, I, I and this might be. Really I good. see where you're going I bet with that. Really good in a in a in a Coke. Right. Star Wars right. and Coke. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely right. But no. it'd be weak as hell. But that could be a good thing with a Coke, so you don't get too shwasted. Yeah, <laughs> too shwasted. <laughs> so what? What would you? I, I'll I'll wrap back around in that, and then of course myself. But what would you pay for this, Anthony? If if this were a price in a store, what would you pay for it? I would pay like twenty three bucks for this. Wow. Um, disrespectful <laughs> not not what would you pay I see a lot of 23 dollar whiskeys i think maker's mark is 23 bucks is it not i mean that's uh, fair not the one that we like no no i'm saying just like generic maker's mark generic maker's yeah he's a bourbon already right oh come on i don't want to yeah. the the base maker's mark for 750 is right around 20 bucks okay. 25 bucks yeah and that is a bourbon a yeah. technical bourbon, and it's pretty dang good. Okay, no, it's like twenty. You said twenty nine bucks or no twenty five? It was twenty five yeah. bucks. Depends Actually, on which one you go, but yeah, like you can get it between twenty and thirty bucks almost everywhere. If you can get makers for twenty five, I don't think I would pay more than twenty one for this. Actually. Wow, Matt, what would you what would you pay? What what cost wow. when you go into a store? You see the cost underneath this bottle. What cost makes you go, I'm buying it? I give you $30. Take or leave. Really? Take or leave? $30. Okay. That's it. I, I, res I respect what you have done with the flavors. They are good. Nice. I have oh. a plan. I have a plan that we need to enact this. What's okay. that? Well, maybe not yet. I don't What's know. That? Remember, I, we, we forgot, but I was like, maybe we should have some, uh, whatever we have in our house. We don't all have to have the same thing, but you know, like, one or two other pores to have and compare it against real time. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, that's you know fair. I mean? That's fair. Seems like that's a fair. decent idea. Yeah, yeah that's fair. You okay, can compare something and just have like, have like a good like uh, benchmark. Baseline. Yeah. A good baseline. Like right now, we all have Star Wars. So like yeah. we could each have a tiny pore of Star Wars with whatever we're trying. And be like, just oh, yeah, the, it's much better. Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> we're to, like, uh, then we're closer to, you know, a, a tasting where you've got I, like three or four in front of you. I think That's we fair. need a good five, though. We need to find I, a whiskey I, that is, well, no, we like need a number five, the rating five. Yeah. Anthony, not oh! five. <laughs> I'm like, we're trying to no. get wasted on the podcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, I mean, like, we need to find one that is our, our considered perfect five. That like way is we can American. always compare it to our true baseline of like, this is that's our idea. We, we could each try to find that for ourselves because I like having one of those at yeah. my house, something that's not pricey, something yeah. that I can just sip on because I feel like it, but I don't want to break out the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's probably going to be the Red Breast 12 for me. I'm going to be real. No. <laughs> Wait, what? That's, that's like my go-to benchmark. For sure, the twelve-year. Oh, you say the twelve-year. You think it's five? I am saying that the Red Breast Twelve, the base Red Breast Twelve, is a five for me. It is. It is what I consider the daily drinker. Perfect. You can get it for fifty bucks. Oftentimes, it's super affordable. It doesn't have the proofing of the higher Red Breasts. It's not a Red Breast cask strength. Not talking about that one. Like we talked the Red Breast 12 cast strength. We're looking at, you know, an eight, right? We're moving up. But the base Red Breast 12 that is super affordable is what I consider the middle of the road. Everybody's going to like this five out of 10 whiskey. If you see it on sale, see, you're probably it. picking it up. Yeah, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I know that there's just a big difference between our tastes and our like absolutely uh, what we see as a, an affordable daily drinker because mine's right around twenty five maximum thirty dollars per seven fifty mil Damn, to to like have that as a daily drinker because that's Maker's Mark that's Woodford's and that stuff is fine but if something is aged for twelve years and you give it a five. <laughs> 
Bro, that means they're bad. No, no. <laughs> it's, That's bad. It, if it's, I, if it's Anthony, a seven or twelve years, they make a mistake. I have, You've offended them. <laughs> I have said many. I have said this before on the podcast. <laughs> My rating system: ninety-five percent of whiskeys should be like five or less for me. Should that's, be. that's not because they're bad. Five is a good average whiskey. Like five is the minimum bar. Statistics statistics would say that if 95% of yours are a number, that number should be 9.5. No. Uh, all I'm getting at is that five is a good, a great standard daily drinker whiskey for me. I'm not basing any of my observations off of Ant, uh, off of Eric's scale anymore. <laughs> when Eric was five, he was nine point five. <laughs> what to get? It, here's the thing: if I say a six, it is above average. Like this is a good whiskey. Eric, I got it. Eric's one to ten is logarithmic. It goes <laughs> yep. straight up. Yeah. Oh. Straight to the top there, kid. You know, you that's, just made that's not wrong. So I'll go on to my... <laughs> oh my god. With with that said, I'll go on to my uh, rating for this, which I, I would put at a... <laughs> at a, a what? A 2.5. Oh, wow. Um... Now, with that said, which is about the same as us, if you consider the logarithm. Yes, yes. Yep. yep. But mm -hmm. I will say there are some things that I really like this, and I, I think to highlight this, I think at a at the price point you're looking at, which by the way, this bottle is around fifty bucks. No. At around fifty bucks, you're looking at a, a tough sell for me. I yes. think at around. 35 bucks this is a great entry single malt option that is if you like single malt whiskeys already at about 35 to 40 bucks this is in a beautiful price range there isn't much at the 35 dollar range for single malt whiskeys that are going to have the approachability as this, this does yeah that's fair right there there are single malt whiskeys around 35 to 40 bucks that are good they're not as approachable i no. think they really nailed the the tag the thing that they were going for they're looking for an approachable single malt whiskey that is affordable in australia which i think this meets that bar australian like buying whiskey in australia is a different market than what we experience here in the states and so Fair. when you're looking at that i really think they accomplished something really cool here and i i think the company has done something awesome in general. And so I would I would definitely love to try out more of their stuff. I think the flavor profile that they're going for here, which is a single malt whiskey, which not everyone's going to be on board with. But if you like single malt whiskeys, definitely check out more of their options. I think they have a cool line of stuff. And if you're in Australia, like this might be a no-brainer. This is a company you probably want to support. They're doing some awesome, uh, awesome stuff here. Absolutely. I do think that more mature aging will change the game here. I really want to see some more of those wood notes come out. Um, well, and you've already said that they have them already present in some of their uh, exactly, other exactly. lines. So yeah. it's more so like these people have already matured their line enough to have multiple yeah. ages yeah. within multiple bottles. This is their so, opening line. Yeah. Right. So we have we have seen their 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 lowest common denominator. Right. Which I consider a solid entry into the affordable single malt uh, whiskey genre. And so. The fact that there are other ones to try, it, I think, is pretty exciting. Very exciting. I would, exciting. I would love to try some of their single barrels, especially, um, and then also some of their interesting cask strength. Well, yeah. Well, I think their single barrels. I got, I got to check. Their single barrels are pretty high proof. I don't know if they deproof them at all, but they're sitting at fifty six percent. So, I mean, we're looking at 112 proof. Um, now, okay. this is very interesting. It, it costs significantly more in Australia to buy this. It's roughly yeah, $60 US. 
and yeah. it's only 700 milliliters. It has a completely different. Uh, no, this um, is 750 sticker? milliliters. No, ours is 750. You could buy ours in the states right now online oh. for 55 dollars from their website. Wow. But you have to pay an additional seven dollars to get what should be the same thing from their website with a different sticker different label and it's 50 milliliters less wow so they're trying to bring affordable whiskey to australia but it's still more expensive than what it costs <laughs> wow that's crazy oh, yeah that's that's a that's, a, that's weird that's How weird that make that's a little um, bit that's a little off maybe the taxes are a little nuts yeah over i there. don't know and that I that, I ha- that has to be it that I has to, to assume it. right I, um, I was just joking. I'm sure they're not assholes because they made it. No, decent. of course yeah, not. That was just funny. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing this has me hoping is that I hope that I still have this bottle when we come to our next single malt, so that I can compare. I have a feeling you will. Just from j- judging from your initial reaction to this bottle, I don't think you'll be sipping this any anytime soon. I since I have officially killed my cast strength. Uh, maker's mark this may become my daily driver just because i don't really have anything else that i'm willing to put on the chopping block for that yeah um but yeah i you, I'm probably you have, have to a start doing some, look it's 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 whatever do you like okay? do you like that nika is phenomenal that nika is okay it's a coffee infused nika and it's, no it's, it's not coffee infused. infused it's not it's coffee co- infused co- it's they co- use it? a coffee still which is not coffee. They are okay. different terms altogether. A coffee still okay. is. You remember when we went to Old Forester and they had that giant still that was yeah. in the back? That is yeah. a coffee still. Oh. Oh. Yeah. They okay. put in. They put in the liquid at the top, and it goes through multiple levels oh. of filtering, and then it I comes out it at the had bottom. Some form of flavor of coffee. No. No coffee oh. flavor. No coffee flavor. Man, that is a I don't traditional need to be on this podcast, y'all. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know uh, shit about uh, Matt, whiskey Matt, or bourbon, um, man. Oh my Eric, god! I think Eric gave me one of those like a year or two ago, and for uh, the past year or two, I thought it was infused with coffee too. So I am oh just oh my now. gosh! <laughs> no, that is a in the same boat. that is a great <laughs> Japanese whiskey by the Nika Distillery, oh. um, and it's it is really good. Really I will probably not put it on my daily drinker because I will probably try and get through this one first. No bottle left behind. Yeah, this will get finished. I love the artwork on it. Oh, dude, the, the marketing I'm, great. Yeah, marketing is great. And I would definitely look into more of their stuff if it's available in any of the liquor stores that I uh, frequent <laughs> now. Agreed. That being said, this will probably go down as one of the. Uh, bottles that I will definitely avoid because as somebody who values a good experience and a good taste for what I like, this is something I would avoid. I I could see that. I definitely want more out of it. I'm excited to try some of their other stuff, but I probably won't return to this bottle at this price point. No. Um, If somebody tells me that they like a single malt and this is you know, a friend of a friend or I'm going to a party type of deal. Um, And I know they like single malts. I think this is interesting enough as a a, a kind of like getting to know you present type of deal. You would recommend this to somebody? I think if you like single malts and you're trying to, or uh, like you, you like single malts and you're trying to get an approachable option for single malts, I don't know that I've had a single malt that is more approachable than this for an affordable price. I think hmm. single malts, especially low age single malts, tend to be pretty harsh whiskeys. They tend to be like something that I would drink, but not something that a person who's just getting into whiskeys will drink. And so to have something that is like, hey, this has the single malt flavor. But it's a little sweeter, a little bit more subdued, a little bit more approachable is pretty nice. If you like this, you know you will like single malt whiskeys, even some of the more harsher ones. If you don't like this, 
then you're probably not going to like a lot of those single malt harsh whiskeys until they get to like insane price levels and the aging starts to kind of mellow out the flavors and bring out more of the oaky, sweeter flavors, right? And so while it wouldn't be something that I go to on a normal basis, if somebody's like, hey, I want to try out single malt whiskeys, I'm going to be like, hey, if you like you this go. one, this is a great starting point for single malt whiskeys. That's not because like Anthony said, if you go to a store and you try to like dive into single malt whiskeys and you start trying some at random, you're going to run into some really just harsh whiskeys. True. That true. If you don't have an exposed palate to whiskey in general, so those are going to turn you off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's going to be really rough for you. This one, yeah. you can try it and say, ah, I don't really like the flavor, but I would argue that this is nowhere near as harsh as some of the other whiskeys that Anthony has had, right? I, and he kind of backed that up too. My statement to that then is if an intro perspective of this is already saying that the, the taste is lackluster or not as approachable as anything that they've tasted before. What inspires a newcomer to single malt whiskeys to, after drinking this, try others? I, <clears throat> well, I think the thing is that there are people that aren't the three of us that will drink this and be like, holy shit, that's amazing. And that is a single malt person. Yeah. Oh. That just loves that flavor. I think none of us loves malt. I bet if I bet the next time we get a malt, we're all going to be like, nah, you know, Ooh. and maybe ideally we compare it to this, right? Are we linked for we are sugar boys? Well, <laughs> I, I do love a good single malt scotch. Uh, my, it, oh, it's just the, the prices Eric. of the, no, I mean, but to, to be fair, the Man, prices of the, the single malts that I like. <laughs> The, Disgusting. The prices of the single malts that I like aren't an affordable quote unquote price. Like, I'm not going out and buying them every day. And so, to have something that's around the $50 mark that I haven't like searched around for that isn't super peaty is pretty nice. Like, uh, okay. like I, I don't think there's a lot of other single malts that really offer the experience that this one has that I have tried yet. Mm, mm. Right. And your cheapest option is something like it really gets into that type of thing are going to be pretty expensive. Yeah. Like in the hundred to $150 range, you're going to start finding a lot of single malts that I feel are really, really good. That's not really uh, affordable. So I feel like the official like note on this, this uh, whiskey is that there are others like it who will eventually taste better for you. But if you are trying to get in to single malt whiskeys, this is a great attempt at getting towards the flavor profile of single malt whiskeys. Yeah. If this is not to your liking, it is and you are looking for a different experience, this may be your ticket off of the train and looking for other options like bourbon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's exactly how I would put it. It is like- Absolutely, okay, cool. This, this is a determiner. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add that um, for me, a daily drinker, would be Woodford's Reserve, and I would highly recommend it because it's not going to break the bank. You can get a huge bottle of it if you like it, like uh, a full. What do you? I can't remember. I'm not in college anymore. One point seven five liters, and it is against, and it's only like maybe fifty bucks for that much, you know. And then this is a good price. It's like twenty five, maybe twenty six for the handle. I think is what you call it. Or half. I don't even mm, see any alcohol that comes in a handle. I'm immediately kind of suspicious of. So oh, you're gonna I'm have sorry. to go ahead. There is no handle. I thought I forgot that handle means there's like literally a handle. Yeah, literally a handle. It does not have that as an option. I for some reason have tried using that as a term for measurement. Seven hundred and fifty mil is what I meant. 
It has not ever come in a handle form. They always have a very distinct shaped bottle, which is pretty cool. And so, Nat, if if you're looking for a daily drinker, if you don't, if you haven't tried it, I would try Woodford's Reserve because it is. Is she juicy? It is five. It's a five. Is she juicy? It's my go-to. If I'm at a bar and I don't know what I want, ask for Woodford's. Is they it Woodford's? Ask for Makers. I don't it think juicy? It's, it's a bourbon. It's a it's bourbon. I am on the I'm on it, the hunt for juicy me, whiskey at this point in time. To me, a Woodford, <laughs> Sorry, bourbon. So to me, a Woodford's is like a burger. Like, oh, I really want a burger right now. Mm. And what you're describing to me is like, ooh, I want like a Hawaiian burger, you know, or no, I want like a... I don't want... Ew, ew. Hold on. First off, how dare you assume that I would love a Hawaiian burger? Take your you? pineapple, <laughs> take your right? pineapple and put it into a fruit salad where it belongs. First off. It's a fried first pineapple. Off, first, no, fried. first off. Anyway, second off. Spicy. Spicy second, Hawaiian. Second Spicy off. Spicy Hawaiian. I am looking for an experience with alcohol that is more reminiscent of high end chocolate of I'm getting a wealth of information in terms of flavor where I can take my time with it and actually like break down the individual blocks of it. So far, we have had in the time that we've been drinking alcohol together, I've had that experience maybe three times. So, oh, yeah, the minute the minute. You get a whiskey that doesn't have any additives, but brings out a dark chocolate dried fruits vibe. Not even, not even dark chocolate dried fruits. Shit, I'm talking good. like just do yes, dark chocolate and dried fruits, but also like adding individual elements to it that like you wouldn't suspect. Like, Agreed. I don't, I don't know if you can put snowberry into a, into a bourbon, but maybe there's a note of snowberry. I, look, yeah. I don't know, but I, I enjoy whiskeys that are sorry, bourbons in this case because I've yet to find a whiskey that I like. Um, yeah, the I enjoy minute- bourbons that, that take me to that place where like I'm, I'm ranging through what it's given me. And I can sit there for at least 30 seconds and be like, okay, I have a good idea as to like what's actually happening here. But there are probably some things that I, f- I failed to pick up. That's what yeah. I want. Yeah. Evolution. I, I think, yeah. and I think everybody kind of looks for that after a while in whiskey. I, I think some people that are kind of just dipping their toes every now and then into the, the whiskey market, they kind of buy things for drinking every now and then. They find a flavor that they like and they stick to it and that's it. They, they have their yeah. one whiskey. But I think as you dr- try more and more, rather than looking for the one note that tastes really good, you really want or are, are driven to find evolution in flavor during mm-hmm. the drink. And that requires just a whole myriad of things to kind of like culminate and come together in one whiskey that is hard to do and so when you find whiskeys that do that it's just really cool it's really special yeah Yeah. so skyward we rated it we tasted it it tasted okay yeah or single malts go for it for others Maybe look elsewhere, but the branding is incredible. Oh, I'm yeah. sure the line is also fantastic. Honestly, I would I'd be very interested to see what else Star Wars has do- does. I will be on the lookout to see them inside any liquor stores and see if they have anything else yeah. outside of this <clears throat> line to be interested in. The steam barrel part portion, I'm a little skeptical of until I have another um, entry that does the same thing in terms of steam barrels. But for now, this is, was an experience, uh, one I will choose not to repeat by my own volition, but it oh. is a great, a great little introduction to a brand that has done a lot of good work towards uh, enticing others to engage in this hobby. Yeah. And let me, let me just read off a little bit of their, their flagship whiskey, um, just because it's kind of on this is not the the, flagship no oh oh, well uh, this is kind of their like send out the troops type of ship so this isn't their their flagship. their their major one is scouting party 
Is it the Solera? No, it's the, uh, the. I think I think the Solera is what Nat wants. Uh, I could see, see that too. I could see that too. Oh my god! Let me Nat, let get... me let me read off this Vitalis. The the Vitalis, which sounds very interesting. On the nose, chewy toffee, raisins, chocolate coated pineapples, and cedar. On the palate, big viscous rich dried fruits with red currants and lightly roasted coffee beans a long oily finish with fruit and oak it's a blend of different whiskeys aged from four to ten years to give it a little bit more aging um Sounds really good. It got the double gold at the San Francisco um, World Spirits Competition, which is a, a huge uh, accolade to get. Um, could be a wonderful try for us on one of the episodes. I, I definitely think that they have enough going on that I would be down to try more of Star Wars stuff. I would. Sorry. Try, I think we should put the the gift pack on our list of people. The octave barrels looks interesting as well. Mm. Yeah, the only problem with the gift pack is that it includes the Nova, which we have a full bottle. Ah, uh, fudge. So I mean, Nat, I think you're gonna go crazy for the one that we were talking about, and then Eric is gonna go crazy for Star Wars. Or sorry, yeah. not Star Wars. I'm not saying Star Wars ginger beer. Oh, oh yeah, it sounds so cool. Ginger beer. Oh yeah, my it god, sounds so cool. Okay. okay, it's sold out. No. Yeah, it, it is sold out. Me. You have me at hello, Star Wars. So yeah. your initial uh, offer, not exactly something I would look for on my own. Well, but you know who we blame? Your line, your line Maybe looks are. super dope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we might want a sponsorship, but. Honestly, why, why, why'd you pick this one? Why? Why though? Yeah. Friends, that was enjoyable. Let's play our free found sponsor. Us, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, technically we chose it. They didn't choose it for us. That's true. That's true. We chose this that model. Was, that's on us. We and and I will also say that Flaviar had many more options that we all wanted more than this one, but we didn't all have that option. That's Absolutely. True. That's true. We had a hunt for something that all three of us could get. Yes. Which was yeah. very difficult. And Star Wars was a very cool option. This was my first Australian whiskey. I'm I'm pleasantly surprised uh by the approachability. I, I think they hit their mission statement. I'm excited to try more. Hey, and now now that we have all these vials for our future taste tests that uh Eric provided us. Perhaps we don't have to hunt for the same one. We can all get different ones. And then we fill up those empty vials for when we meet up and can yep. share. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 100%. With one another. Absolutely. Yeah. Man, so uh, I don't have any Star Wars in my local area. That's going to uh, suck. Okay. I have to order from the site. This is going to suck. Yeah. So, uh, with that section concluded, Anthony, what, yeah. have you, what have you been playing this week or this, this month? So, this month, the most recently, I started playing Sea of Thieves again because uh, season it's ten is ending and season eleven is starting, and they're doing some neat things with season eleven starting on Tuesday, where uh, you just can dive straight into the action when you start. So instead of having this slow build up and having fifty percent of the boats that you encounter have nothing on them because they're actually on the way to do something. They will now get to go straight there. There's some things that you can't go straight to. There's just like the Fort of Fortune and the Fort of the Damned. But everything else you can go to once you've earned the right. Like you can go straight to a raid or you can go straight to a voyage. And you can just get into the action right away and shorten your play session. So that's like pretty great looking change coming out. And they're rebalancing everything. Um, and so... The game's in a okay spot. It's it's very enjoyable with friends, but it's still just terrible when it comes to uh, net code and mm. and code code. Like it's just uh -huh. it's got a lot of issues still. But I would uh -huh. say that the game in season eleven finally seems like it might be almost out of beta. 
<laughs> you know, oh. I think this <laughs> your game is trash. Oh god, for oh, five right. years. We've been Sorry. playing an alpha for five years. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> and oh. uh, it's okay. But um, so yeah, I've been playing that, and it's been fun, and it's a great game for content because you can just goof off with people, and people actually chat. But uh, I've also played some Lego Fortnite, which was surprisingly cool. I played that with my wife. It looks so um, really cool. It okay. it's pretty great. It's like Valheim, um, and I guess it's just like Valheim, honestly. I mean, you've got villagers. It's like Valheim and Terraria come together a little bit in Minecraft. But in the yeah. Lego in the Lego verse, which is in the Lego, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. So it's it's pretty it's pretty fun. It's it's enjoyable. It's chill. Um, but also intense, and there's some crazy things you can do. I, I, we have not gotten anywhere near the crazy things. We've we've just built a little bit of a fortress. That's it. that's about it. And we got some villagers. Um, other than that, obviously, I played a ton of World of Warcraft Scenes of Discovery with you guys. Oh my god! Uh, since we all beat Phase One, and Phase Two comes out on the eighth. Yeah, February. Speaking of, I eighth. need to get my I need to get my gloves done. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I will yeah. probably have to eventually oh, yeah. finish out one more raid so I can finish up my uh, epic. Yeah. I also have to farm gold because apparently it like... Okay, for any for those listening and not knowing what we're talking about, Season of Discovery in World of Warcraft is the iteration of uh, a classic WoW, which for those who may not know, classic WoW is the version of wow that is completely rewound all the way to the beginning of the entire story so the very first base game you know how we saw the special on south park that version of the game is what you play you don't play what the current retail version of wow actually is so you play all the old quests you have a whole ton of nostalgia bait to get it to get you back in and for some it's the only way to enjoy wow now because retail is absolutely insane all that being said season of discovery is a twist on it where they allow you to take some skills from further into the game and pull them back into the past with you so that you can use them so like and some things are unique. Ta- yeah, and some things are unique. Some things the have not been unique. seen before, right? So warlocks can actually have a tanking stance. Shamans can also tank all sorts of things that were not possible even in retail. While wow now, that being said, I have some gripes. <laughs> the fact that it a is... ton of the game is based on a gold grind is the worst experience for me it's the worst Agreed. i don't Agreed. care what you say i don't Eric. like it's I, the no, worst. no 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 it's no no i'm 100 percent on board with that i i hate uh, there are a few things about phase one that are really really great i think it's a yeah. great twist on classic but absolutely it's not it's still classic no. it still, it's still cl- has no, some no, of no, the no, gripes no, no. You that are will classic not put the, you will not put this on classic you will no put i'm not this, i'm not i'm not you will i'm put transitioning this on faulty choice of dependencies when looking at the end game of phase one agreed the fact that there yeah, is a rune like an epic quest instead of crafting because crafting yes. is just bad in classic like if crafting oh i'm a miner what do you need to mine shit? Just a freaking quarry. A proper yeah. quarry. Like places to go where you can get that crafted stuff. But since they don't have that, it's terrible. But if every crafting thing had like a go to the farm, get this stuff. My gripe is different. But yeah, yeah I, I, I think the biggest thing is that... I thought it was the epic that needed all the money. No, he's talking about the... Um, it, there are runes. Oh, so the biggest thing is... The biggest thing... There is one particular rune for each class that requires you to get a bunch of these fish oils from murlocs, a bunch of these shredder parts from goblin shredders in the thousand the islands, thousand thorn veil no, or whatever. Arathi Highlands. Uh, yeah. no, uh, they're not in Arathi Highlands. They're in the thousand needle they're not, span. They're not. In the, they're not in thousand needles. Yeah. I can, anyway, I can guarantee specific, you they're not in Thousand Needles. I think they are. Agreed, agreed. 
So, and the, the reason that I was off is because if you play a paladin, you'll have a great time as long as you don't want to be a healer, because then you don't have to get those really difficult rooms and, yes. and do all that. So I didn't experience that because I'm like, I don't need that shit. So, I'm not going to have to grind it. And here, just to, for reference, two of them, you can grind yourself. It takes a little bit of time. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of them requires you to have an engineering uh, scroll that only drops in dead mines. Yep. That scroll has like a 10% drop rate. Mm -hmm. But it means that if you're an engineer and you have that scroll, you're going to sell that. But here's the problem that really ensues. Every single person needs to have their that profession, item. not that item, but their profession for their epic. Yes. That means oh, that I see what you mean. Yeah, one yeah, of yeah. your professions is going to be your Leather working, Leather armor working, craft, or, whatever. Or armor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or blacksmithing. Yeah. yeah. And so one of them is taken. Your other one, if you don't want to pay a lot of money for your epic, has it's to be the, the gathering thing, of the your... gathering that. Yeah. Which means there is a small percentage of the player base that is going engineering and one of their crafting professions to get them their, themselves their epic. Those people, or, or no, or they are just doing the gathering and the and engineering, or some other offshoot of al like alchemy. Or oh yeah, like they that. could sacrifice their epic altogether. Altogether, yes. Yeah. But essentially, what it means is, if you want to play the game and get all of your runes, when you get to the shredder part, you have to buy them unless you leveled up engineering, which requires a lot of money because engineering makes a lot of money because of the shredder. So that means all the engineering stuff costs a lot of money. Well, Every yeah. single part costs at least a gold and 15 silver, something yeah. like that. It's so to put you in the in the right frame set of mind, when you end the game at 20 level 25 in this span of time, you have maybe two, three gold, maybe. Right. Yeah. Am I wrong, guys? No, I would say that's after, pretty after, accurate. Tra after training all of your skills yeah. and making sure that you are yeah, like up to, get up to max date. Level. Yeah. yeah, once you get to max level, you have yeah, three, three gold left. left. Yeah. Yeah. You, need, you need 23 of those turbocharged uh, super shredders. Yeah. That's 23 yeah. gold. It's, sorry, not even 20. That's well, I was 23 about to plus say, gold that you they're, need. They're like insane, 30. too, because I think at... On our server, at least, that we're playing on, I've seen them as high as like five or six gold. Let me see. Well, that's another problem. I don't know if y'all saw, but uh, I saw an Asmund Gold little video or short, and apparently, uh, gold sell uh, sellers in Season of Discovery is a huge problem. Yeah. And so, all the prices have gone insanely inflated because people are buying gold with real money yeah. and then making the price of things go really high because they're yeah. like, oh, that's not that's like two dollars, you know, yeah. and, it's like, and you you want to know why they're that's such a problem is because in my opinion, and, and I think there are going to be people who buy gold anyways, and there's a lot of problems that come along with that. And you, you there's a lot of solutions that Blizzard kind of has to work with there that are really, really difficult. But I will say the easiest solution to that type of thing is to make engaging gameplay that people want to interact with. It makes them yeah. want to play the game rather than care about buying gold to get it faster. If you make yeah, the gameplay engaging, and it just so happens that two are uh, really one <laughs> of their in-game things, you can buy all of these things, and therefore, and it's a lot of time, but that time is not spent in an engaging way. You're just farming shredders, farming murlocs, or farming dark iron dwarves. That's not that engaging. It's not interesting enough. It and when you consider that it takes probably, I would argue, at least about five to six ish, maybe even longer, depending on your drop rates, hours of farming. And you have to have engineering to even be able to farm one of them. But let's say you do, even if you have the engineering, now you have to farm for that for a few hours too. You're looking at a full work day of people who really are already working, already doing this stuff. The average like age range of the player base for Seasons of Discovery, I would argue, is probably 25 to 40, right? Yep. These people are working yep. full-time jobs, 
they don't really want to farm unless it's fun. Yep. And there are ways to make these farms fun through questing or more interesting things. There are there are runes that they did that are super interesting, and I love the design of them, and they're super fun to do. It just so happens that one of them takes a lot of time or a lot of money and is mindless to do, and guess what? I would argue that that one rune is why a majority of the player base buys gold in Seasons of Discovery. Absolutely. 16 of these items is necessary to make you end game viable for anything that you're attempting to do with your friends for doing that the raid that has been teased within season of discovery so if you are wanting to do things with your friends right now it is going to take you at least 16 gold hours whatever it takes you for for you to get 16 16 plus gold to get these items i i would argue that's even a low estimate too i think i spent uh i i farmed everything that i could farm but when i had to buy the sh shredders i mean they were yeah. at like three gold a piece it was going to be it's, over like 40 gold to buy yeah. it yeah it was the so, shredders it's the dark art iron ordinance and the fish oil yeah. the dark iron ordinance is probably like the middle expense yeah. Yeah. and then like even after this once you start getting into oh i have the rune now how do i create my item it's a base of five gold that you have to have outside of the mats yeah to be yeah, able, yeah, yeah. Be, be able to progress flat. this to, to progress this the quest i hate it yeah i think I they hate it so much I think they could have easily solved this if they would have gone sort of the new world approach where they just increase substantially how many mining nodes there are, how many herbalism nodes there are, leather working's already doing good, and then you just adjust the crafting material requirements for those things towards those things that you get an abundance of. You, you don't do the fish oil crap, you don't do monster grinding for stuff, you only do that in the world stuff that is, people like doing that, oh I found a a plant i'm gonna take that plant and then i can make my epic with it on my own and it doesn't inflate the cost of things like it's insane that everything you craft costs you money to craft it you don't craft it and gain money that which means that there is a resource drought the resources yeah. aren't there so all yeah. they had to do was increase the number of nodes yeah. put tons of mining nodes tons of not, herbalism nodes. not even okay not even Let's increase the number of nodes. Remove the necessity for a single trade skill to dominate yeah. the Ooh, acquisition. That's of that a is room. my biggest problem, by the way. I I, I would argue Anthony's right. Points. Right. Well, yeah, he's right. Yeah. 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 Anthony, I agree with all your points, but I will Shouldn't say, we all be able to gather, like, do all the gathering skills for free. We should no. all be able to mine, all be able to herbalize, all be able to do every single so one of those things, that, just like New World. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing, but I would argue there is a bunch of design philosophies in place that make classic classic. Yeah. In this particular case, they have a rune that requires engineering, a crafting skill, not a gathering skill. And it requires a crafting skill to be able to do it without buying stuff. So... Yeah. If you don't have engineering, you have to buy it. And that mm. in and of itself is a design philosophy that I feel was very interesting to me. I don't understand why they did it. I don't particularly agree with that choice. It seems like they just artificially inflated engineering because they were like, oh, if you do engineering, you don't get an epic for engineering. So it's got to be better in some way. We got to do something cool with it. Right. Oh, let's right. make it a rune requirement, right? And I just feel like that wasn't the right decision to make, right? Make that rune more interesting to get, but not by requiring a particular profession that creates a weird sort of bottleneck. I would, I want to see, the rune system is so cool. I want yeah, to see runes, like the, the mage rune is so awesome. You go to a graveyard, you find an undead mage, you beat him, and then you get a rune and it's really hard. You have to have a group to do it. It took us like what, 40 minutes or something like that when I did it with Anthony. And it was a cool little quest with interesting stuff. And at the end, you got an awesome reward with a rune by grouping up with people. 
cool engagement. That should be every fucking rune. The fact yes. that there is any rune that isn't that type no. of thing is the problem, in my opinion. That was, that, that was really good, because there's a classic quest where I had to get my green helmet in Duskwood, and it was a huge, long quest chain, and at the end, I had to fight a guy in the same area that we got the rune you're talking about for you from, but for a classic green helm, and me and the priest, I'm a paladin, spent 15 minutes fighting this boss. We killed all the ads, and we were just barely hanging in there and getting it done. And that is, that's an awesome classic experience that you don't usually get to experience because the level cap isn't 25, so no need to get that helmet. Just right. move yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Because the level cap is 25, I was like, yes, I'm going to get that helmet. And getting your rune was a more epic version of that. Yeah. And, and those types of experiences are why I still, to be fair, Picking at a really awesome twist on classic. I think season of discovery was really well done outside of like one or two things that just have really weird gripes to them that I, I feel were just <laughs> huge misses on their part. But overall, those types of experience that Anthony's talking about are so cool. Such a interesting thing. I think the, the problem, the biggest problem is that that experience depends on whether or not you require one of the runes that runs into the issue. Yeah. And fuck. that makes yeah. it so that uh, if you pick a class right now, Paladin's great. Paladin's great. Mage is oh, great. Tank and DPS Paladin are great. Holy Jeez. Paladin, you're your butt hurt. Yeah. And druid so it's fucking horrid, y'all. Yeah. And so if you're like a tank druid, which Nat is, right? If you pick the Mistake. wrong class where your requirement is essentially, hey, you got to play like 15 hours more than everybody to grind this stuff and then farm enough gold for a market that is under, uh, like, uh, uh, that all these shredder guys are taking advantage of and selling it for insane prices. If you pick a class where that's a requirement, you get to the end game and everybody else gets immediate levels of fun and cool quests. And you're like, guys, I gotta, I gotta grind this for like eight travel. hours, right? Because I could play my healer mage without ever getting that rune, and immediately when I hit level twenty five, I'm like, oh well, I can just do the cool stuff now and run dungeons and do awesome and heal and all this kind of cool stuff. And then other classes are like, I have to go grind gold for eight hours to afford shredders mm -hmm. because I'm not engineering, and it's like. Yep. Yep. what like that's insane and, and pray that you get lucky and get drops enough so that you can work on your reputation with the uh yeah. commerce yeah. authority so that you can buy your other rune that is also useful because if you don't have it you have no contribution no. towards a major fight near the end and, of the raid and here's here's Bro, the thing that baffles me though start. here's the, the weirdest part about all of this blizzard fixed that one i feel they lowered the requirement from the honored to friendly. Friendly, friendly. takes yes, like true. 25 minutes to get. True. Like if you just focus on it for about half an hour, you're you going to get it. friendly. Yeah. All you have to do is go outside of the major city. Kill some shit. There's going to the be and keep bringing the boxes back. You do that for 30 minutes. I think I got you're friendly done. so quickly. Yeah. And so they fixed that, but they haven't lowered the requirement on like shredders. What if you only had to get like one shredder? Right? I'd be so happy. Right? So happy. Oh but, my God. But instead, they have such an arbitrarily large requirement for that that it's very weird. It's, ridic it's ridiculous. You know, I'm glad so, it's over for me. I'm happy yeah. that we I've moved on, but it's just like it's one of those that I'm just like, um, I really wish I could have the experience of just going and killing something like everybody else. Yeah. And then that being the experience of like, hey, I grouped up with some people. I did a few quest uh, steps together with them and we got it done. Like, I love whenever you're in a cave and you don't realize that there is a escort quest inside of it, but you see a massive group come in and they have one spot available and they invite you and you have that experience of like, I didn't even know. I needed this, but I'm so but glad I'm here now. Yeah. Right? That is what I think the rune should eventually get to. I would love for them to be a little bit more myriad as we get through it. And obviously, that's going to be the case because they're not yeah. going to be just. This isn't going to be the only runes they they make yeah. available to us. Yeah. 
that I'm excited for said, phase two. Phase two is going to be interesting. That being said, I'm going to need them to come a little bit more correct with their bullshit because I, 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 I can tell you right now if i have to grind gold after at the end of phase two to go ahead and keep up with y'all i'm done yeah that's a, I, that's have rough. Other, that's I, have, yeah. I have other things to do i fell behind on my coursework because of this game no i will not, yeah. no uh, that's i refuse so, what, i refuse sorry. one other thing i wanted to add though with the waylaid supplies that was another opportunity to steal something from new world you get that box it's got materials in it and because of that it gives you a recipe to make the six copper short swords for way less supplies than you would usually use oh yeah that'd be dope and to make them in one that's what new world did that was like oh we need this oh and you just craft all of it at once yeah and you give it in and it's actually worth it rather than giving you the shaft and making you spend five gold to make one silver or ten silver like sucks so you were playing anything else that you were playing there anthony Um, before you sent us over the goddamn deep end (laughs) you know i've got a good uh i'm in the car game still called rumble but that's yeah we already know yeah and what looks very interesting there's a very very interesting game that my wife is definitely going to play and Um, eric's definitely going to play i've already played it play oh my god i played like it's 15 hours power. oh my god it's called power nat, world nat, oh, are, can i nat, nat, can i go second can i go second yeah yeah nat, sure, can i go second yeah sure sure eric you can go second so i've been gone i've been traveling visiting these guys all that kind of stuff and when i get back uh i was like man what am i gonna play i'm dead done with warcraft until phase two i'm like i don't Oh, he's done stuff. until you know what i'm gonna not i'm gonna play i'm gonna continue. play for nat i'm gonna play for nat They're just, just to uh-huh, be fair uh-huh. so i'm looking yeah. at a few things and there are a few things i want to do by the way I'm, I'm in a requisition that we do a tap haven playthrough a lethal company at some point i think it'd be a lot of fun uh-huh. um oh, no. uh i would Sorry. love to get together and maybe we could do a recording and have a special episode of lethal company i feel that'd like be that'd be fun um mm-hmm. but well, the Tavern Plays YouTube channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that'll be dope. But, so, I've, I've also been playing Cobalt Core, which I'll talk about just briefly, because it's a pretty cool concept, but I think it's just missing a few things for me. Um, but Cobalt Core is like a mix between FTL and Slay the Spire. Oh, hell yeah. And it's I love FTL. super interesting, super fun, kind of a nice little time waster. You build decks... You get different cards. It's got like that tree structure from Slay the Spire where you select the next place to go. It's got an interesting, weird story where you're in this time loop because of this, uh, the Cobalt Core, but it's kind of like a singularity event type of deal going on. Very interesting. I just started playing it. Uh, And then Power World came out. (laughs) The game where you can capture anything. The game where you can build anything. And the game, where they have just recently figured out you can capture other humans in the world and then cook them and eat them. And (laughs) this game is Pokemon, but wild. What? It's insane, Nat, and we need to play it. I started playing it. It is super fun. It's got all the cool stuff of Pokemon with a little bit of cannibalism in it and it's amazing cannibalism okay okay let's rewind a little bit because the eric just decided to go all the way to a hundred with this rather than walking you in so let's uh, reframe this a little bit so if you watch the trailer power world is a gentle beautiful world just like pokemon really and there's gyarados really and all the wonderful they, they pokemon in front of you fly on your back go oh, and it's kind of no. like it's kind of like Breath of the Wild. You can, you can play. It's, it plays like Breath of the Wild. It's like it, it's it's like a rust. Yeah, uh-huh. you build up your base. You get resources. Your Pokemon can get resources for you. Stop. Pals. We should say pals so we don't get sued though. It's pals. Your pals. 
The trailer goes in order. I am walking you through the trailer. Eric is going backwards. He's been in button I've, right now. Guys, I've seen the trailer, but I'm... You I, have? I, you know, the yes, pals the can trailer. equip weapons and guns and shoot your invaders. I'm, like I'm very aware of what Pal World has in store for yeah. those who play it. And apparently it's Factor IO as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You, man, it is so much fun it's so cool to just go through this world find different pals collect them it's got like the collection type of deal but it's also got mm. like the base building and stuff from something like mm. valheim it has really so far i'm pretty still i'm still pretty early i've only done the first boss fight but the boss fight was pretty interesting it had some interesting mechanics and there's a little world mini bosses that you can do that are like epic legendary pals type of deal um mm. it's got like yeah a bunch of cool mechanics from like breath of the wild where you the exploration is really cool there's collectibles all over the world and so you can go around collecting stuff for your base that gives you benefits and stuff like that and then just to sprinkle on top of it you have a team rocket corollary where it's a team syndicate type of deal and they go around shooting pals with guns oh and just wild but there's nothing stopping you from locking them in a pokeball and making them slaves and yeah it's just mm -hmm. it's crazy the amount of mm -hmm. stuff that you can do so far it's an mm -hmm. early access game but it's really fleshed out for an early access game i are, i mm -hmm. honestly don't know that i've seen another early access game this fleshed out before and that's really cool uh, it's got crazy reviews on Steam right now. Yeah, it is. It is a very positive. fun time. Yeah. I mean, it's it's breaking Steam. It sold like so many millions of copies. It's like number six in the history of Steam right now. Yeah, it is honestly really really cool. Um, it's a lot it's of fun. Current players, I think, and you can like play co-op and you can have your own little world going along, and it's it's just a lot of fun. So I I've been playing that Ooh. the past few days. Tiny tiny little note before we go back to pal world that's the best part about um lego fortnite is i created a world and i can share it with six other players i think and so if we all had a world we can play separately unlike valheim where you had to play you gotta the be player. there yeah, yeah. or you gotta go through a ton of hoops to set up your own server it's so nice just to be like wife you can play anytime without me i can play anytime without you we can play together it's so great yeah. and, and does pal world do that so Pow World does have uh, dedicated servers, um, uh, but you can also host your own. There are some benefits or cons to the hosting or having a dedicated one. Um, I don't know the details too much yet, but they do have dedicated servers and they do have uh, ones that you can host. Okay. And are so are they private servers? Private dedicated servers? Uh let's see. You want to make a private yeah, it says play Power World dedicated server if you want to make a private server. Um looks like you can, yeah. Have your own little private server going. And they have a server status page. Now I will say their server has been down. For a majority of the release, there's just been too many people playing. Um, they did not anticipate this. Oh, I, I don't think so at all. Like the amount of people that are playing Power World is absolutely wild. I think I've it's heard some skeptical things about the company as well. Uh, I uh -huh. a lot of the things that I see are related to the fact that they took their old game mm -hmm. and then reused a lot of their assets to make this one. I would argue that that's Eh, at best and then of course there there's this idea that they're using ai to kind of generate a lot of these things and was that ai trained on like pokemon assets and how much Very of possible. pokemon are they actually ripping off the only thing i would say to kind of that type of thing is that there's a lot of legal stuff they have to figure out in regards to that mm -hmm. and there's obviously a lot of corollaries to pokemon huge i'm not yeah well, i'm sorry that, but like i know that I, my we brought up ai for this sort of thing and in my opinion if you're using it as a tool 
that's fine. Because if you can use AI to help expedite getting your own content out that you've updated oh, yeah. and stuff, by you know, age, yeah, if it, as long as it's not plagiarism, yeah, it, it will allow us to have things created faster. So me, the three of us, who none of us can easily make assets, but yeah. perhaps we could use AI to make the assets that we then and go and modify, we could actually make a game now yeah. without and, uh, having to have a friend or pay someone that knows how to do that. And that's great for everybody because there's a lot of people out there with great ideas. Agreed. And it's just going to allow them to make those great ideas of reality. I agree wholeheartedly with that statement. Like, regardless of the legalities, which they have to figure out, that is outside of my wheelhouse I don't know what they're going to figure out there, how they're going to like orient, orientate it, you know, and stuff like that. But there are kind of two core issues. One, they used AI. Might have, might yeah. not have been trained to Pokemon. Yep. I don't find any issue with that. The end result is that they have some cool fucking Pokemon that look similar or cool pals that look similar to Pokemon, but like they're different and they have their own move sets and they're doing all kinds of interesting things. It's not unrealistic to have a lightning type pal that shoots a lightning bolt. There's only so many <laughs> lightning style things you can do, right? True. So yeah. to argue that like, oh, they ripped off Pokemon, of course they fucking did. Everybody rips off ideas from everybody else. It's just like making Pokemon a song has, and remixing it. Yeah, like, <laughs> and Pokemon has yet to put building mechanics and other styles of things like this game has into their own games. They're... they're play yeah. entirely different they just happen to overlap in cute creatures that you can collect mm. and eat and eat <laughs> and wow. so you have that aspect of it and then you have the other aspect where they're like oh we reused game assets that we created for our previous game and i'm like anything you That's can do to save time up. yeah like anything you can do to save time there is totally good and i can understand that some people are up in their high horses th that I've seen to kind of like go against this company that is probably defacing something that they have treasured for most of their life being Pokemon. But I think to have that sort of brand uh, loyalty to the extent where you're not willing to see that a product might or might not be better or different in interesting ways and you're just bashing it because it's quote unquote like that brand but different and worse in ways that you think it's worse i i, I think that's just ignorant to some degree right like mm -hmm. like yeah if they were to take pikachu and start defacing pikachu which is an ip owned by game free like sure get up in arms about it if you want if you care about the brand that much but to have somebody create something that's slightly different but uses the same generic principles and then try to improve that and maybe they didn't improve it the way that you think it should be, that doesn't m mean that all of a sudden it's legal problems, right? The, the, the legal issues are going to sort themselves out between those companies as they see fit and they're going to come to a decision there. But from a, like game perspective if you like rust if you like lost ark those styles of games and you like collecting things or pokemon like games this game's right up your alley it does both of those features really really well there are some things that they're going to flesh out throughout early access to make it better i feel there's a lot of little tedious things that'll flesh themselves out but man it's got a lot of cool features too so it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm excited to play it more and collect more pals and all that kind of stuff. It definitely has that, like, it scratches that itch of, like, collecting stuff really, really well. And because you have to go out and, like, explore and find these things in the world, and while you're doing that, you find dungeons and other things and collectibles, it just has a really nice mix. I will say it's. One of the first open world games where I'm exploring and none of the landscape is uninteresting. I like climb a hill and there's like a bunch of pals 
like of a different type that I've never seen before, like grazing and doing interesting stuff. And I'm like, mm. even though they have no collectibles or anything else there, I can go around catching these pals and like bringing them back to my base just because I explored to this one area. And like, it just makes the world feel really dense and saturated and interesting in a way that other open world games, these th same things might be replaced with like monsters that you have to kill. But in this game, finding pals gives you resources and things to do with those pals that other games can't solve. So where one may have a monster there, it still feels empty. But in this one, you're like, oh my gosh, there's a total a field of things that I need. And I need to figure <laughs> out if they do the stuff in my base that I need them to do. Because if I do, I can farm this area that has nothing else in it. It's a totally empty area, quote unquote. But this game quote unquote. makes it feel like it's dense and populated and interesting, which is really cool. Um, unlike other open world games that I've played, especially when it comes to like Rust and Valheim and others, which are great in their own rights and have different things that are amazing about them. But I would argue that they don't have the interest in all of its areas equally like this game does. Which is well, it's, cool. it's only $27. Yeah. I can't believe that people can have so much fun with these games that are so cheap and we still have like 70 80 right. 90 dollar games yeah. oh. like wh why why do we have these triple a overpriced monsters because uh, so and, and they don't deliver they almost never deliver yeah it, it's it's hard uh there are a lot of reasons for that that i feel are Difficult to unpack in a single podcast, or, but I'm, I mean, I'm sure they spend a lot of money on it in certain ways, but it's like wasted. Agreed. <laughs> anyway, there is nothing. There is no price tag on a good game. And if the AAA titles went through, did all the things that they are doing, created wonderful assets and created amazing games that were 10 out of 10 and just awesome nobody would i think nobody would have issues with being like oh AAA titles put more money into their games they make higher at like the fidelity assets they make more content all these things and the games are great nobody would have any issue but instead we get things like starfield which has some things that are really cool interesting ideas but overall just lackluster and if that game were $15, it would be a masterpiece, but instead it's $70 and it just doesn't have the level of quality that you need to make that a great game. But, but, but Eric, there's nothing to do on the moon and, and the moon is oh my fun. Gosh. Yeah. Eric, there's no content on the moon. I am I am a huge I'm a huge advocate over uh interaction over realism um <laughs> like speaking of realism when are we gonna play tarkov oh I'll man i i installed it but, but i can hear you yeah i'm not playing tarkov oh i love tarkov anyway anyway i am gonna play more tarkov <laughs> i wanted to try the arena but i think my uh, arena is just not very optimized at the moment so it's like a really bad experience on my computer especially comparatively to the uh base game base actual game yeah. yeah which is for some reason far more performant um which is weird i think it's got to be like a culling issue where they're not uh getting rid of all of the things that are outside of your rendering area that's the only thing that i can think of and then in the original tarkov they don't have that issue because they're doing more culling and not quite sure yet hmm okay but um, yeah, I'm in the same boat where I also installed Tarkov, but I think there's too many like good games out right now. Pal World, Season yeah, of Discovery, right. Phase Two. There's a lot of things coming out with you know My Sea of Thieves and Star Citizen that I'm just yeah. like. So like maybe the next wipe, 
if yeah. there's a down if there's a down in what's going on if if in terms of other games if they fix the of. performance of arena in, a, in the next few updates i'd be totally down to like jump into arena for like an hour here and there but i i think doing actual tarkov uh yeah i agree i, I just, there's just so much going on right now i want to do power world i want to do uh, phase two um there's just a lot of backlog stuff that Tarkov, yeah, I, I can wait a little bit longer for. I think the first time we got into Tarkov, there, there was a downturn in, in games that were out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just like, oh, what, yeah. what are you going to play? Oh, I never played Tarkov. Let's play that. Yeah. Way down. Mm. Yeah. All so, right. uh, Nat, what have you been up to <sighs> playing? Y'all already know what enjoying. I've been playing. Life. Uh, I've been playing life, but I've also recently picked up Monster Hunter World again. Yes, I saw. Of, because of the release of the announcement for Monster Hunter Wild, there's been an, a there's been a big upturn of people playing it. Uh, I recently watched a streamer that probably most people who are listening to this uh, know of, Asmund Gold. I watched him go from the beginning of the game. Yeah all the way to past where I have played because I yeah. haven't beaten Monster Hunter World as, as I have come to realize. Like I, I beat it when it came out and then Did you? Yeah. Did no. You, no, 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 no. No, you did, did not. You, no, you did not. Did you beat Fatalis? Right. I don't even know who that is. He Fata beat Fatalis wasn't in, there in the initial in, in the exactly. initial release. So we have not beaten the game, Eric. No, 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 no. I, I'm How not the, saying no, that. No, no, Eric. I, I, and I'm, and I'm, I, I'm fully aware of the fact of what you're about to say. You have beaten the base game. Absolutely. The way Monster Hunter games work, the DLCs that come out that, that make, sorry, release the end game fights are the actual version of the game that constitutes you beating the game. No, no, no. In, in all, my, in, all, at least in my head. All I'm saying, when Monster Hunter World released, on release day, all the content that was there on release day, I You beat, beat base game. Yeah. You yeah. beat base game. Fatalis yeah. didn't come out until Iceborne update, like after Iceborne was released. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we... but. In the grand, I get what you're social saying. Social aspect of War Monster Hunter I World, I hundred percented Monster Hunter World on release. Correct. Yes. But you have not beaten no, Iceborne. No, 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 even on release, the what, what is it? Not Zagros, the big thing. What, not, oh yeah, no, I that. I went through and what, beat yeah. all of the release. Yeah, what high rank did you get to? the the maximum you could get to on release there is no maximum yeah no, not not maximum get to. i i know that there was literally no more content i could do on monster hunter world release and then iceborne came out and i i i think nat started playing again and i started like perusing perusing but i never did iceborne fully i never did fatalis i never did any of the updates after that I this never did the Final Eric. Fantasy stuff. This is what happened with Eric. This is what happened with Eric. Oh. He played Base World. Yeah. Not realizing that the way Monster Hunter games work oh. is that the game. Yeah. Ah. I've played every Monster ah. Hunter World game. Hear. Every Monster so Hunter game so almost. It's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. Take it back my time. <laughs> anyway. How Monster Hunter games work is that the initial release of the game is not the end of the game. Agreed. Agreed. Like World of Warcraft. Oh, look, I'm not disagreeing with that. <laughs> yes and no. In the sense for Monster Hunter, there is always a perceived echelon of hunts that start after the base game has been released for a certain amount of time. Agreed. Which is usually the time that people develop their gear for, in WoW for raids. Correct. However... With Monster Hunter, those fights usually coincide with the actual beating of the game. Because there is an end to the number of monsters that are released. And there is an echelon of armor that is released that uh the last monsters fight that are considered end game, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying this to go ahead and shame anyone because I haven't even done it. Yeah. I'm just saying we have not beaten 
Monster Hunter, period. I have never beaten a Monster Hunter game. Not oh. in this sense. So I beat the, uh, the, the GameCube one back in the day. You beat end game fights. What is the GameCube fight? What is that? Three? Is that try? I think it is try. I'd have to look at the. Um, You'd have to look it up. Anyway, I'm going to I'm gonna wait for you to go ahead and look that up. Anyway, I'm playing Monster Hunter World Iceborne. I'm in Iceborne already. I am a hammer and great sword main. And I just like big numbers and I like to bonk monsters on the head. So I have been in between the times where I am hanging out with my wife and and doing finishing up my curriculum for my cybersecurity uh, certificate for security. Plus, I am playing Monster Hunter World because it is easily the most unga bugga turn my brain off and like focus on something a little bit more rudimentary of just like tech, uh, uh, you know, dexterous skill exp- uh, expression rather than me trying to download information into my brain. You know how good that is for you? What? You got this advanced like health tracking sleep tracker thing. And yeah. uh, when I'm playing a game like what you're describing, it'll be like, yeah, you slept for like uh, 12 hours today. Yeah. It started at 3 p.m. <laughs> like, like, what? You shuts slept from 3 p.m. Down. to 8 a.m. Like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> it means you literally had no other motion other than your fingers for like <laughs> a for 12 hours. You just froze in place. Yeah, and when you're mentally and physically tired, that's good. <laughs> it's good. So, yeah, I, I've been playing a whole lot of Monster Hunter World. Um, I just got to the point where I realized that I, uh, I got to the Guiding Lands, and now I've realized that I'm supposed to actually get gear from the Guiding Lands to make sure that the next uh, quest that takes me to the upper echelon doesn't just fucking cart me. Because I'm fighting R- Rajang and getting fucking dumpstered Oof, yeah. every single I'm- time. I have a question. Yeah. Is it hard to go back to Monster Hunter World after the mobility you gain in Monster Hunter Rise? No. Really? No. So uh, what it will teach you is that you have really bad habits. Really? In terms of, in terms of fighting monsters. So if we were to compare mm-hmm. before rise and, and and after rise there is a skill in rise that allows you to uh as soon as you are staggered or done if there's anything done to you you can use a wire bug to just pull yourself completely by multiple frames out of the range of whatever it is that is coming towards you that mm-hmm. it, it is bad it is You're bad saying that rise is like build. easy mode Rise is not easy mode. Rise is more fast paced and um, that's kind of what I was more getting fantastical. Like, is it annoying to have a slower game? Like, isn't world no. just slower getting I to would, the action? I would say that slower? it is a different flavor. You are really? you are much more tuned into the behaviors and the emotions of the monsters. I'll say that I spend a lot more time uh looking at what the monster is doing and knowing what they're going to do immediately after that mm-hmm. motion so that I can plan what I what my action is after that it's oh. I I'm in actual monster chess in Monster Hunter World whereas with Iceborne I am I am chainsaw go burr mo- uh, so it mo- sounds like you like Monster Hunter World Iceborne better than Rise no no, I like, I like both of them. I will say that I, if I were to lean towards one or the other, I would probably say world just because it gives me it is the more graphically intensive game. So it gives me more of the brain sparkly bits of me looking at something and being like, oh, it's pretty. Mm. And then two, it's fantastical enough that I can say that you are slaying like a, like a dinosaur or whatever. They put mm. you in that fantasy. Feels like Where, you're actually doing it. Whereas with Rise, that's there, but in a in a smaller increment because there's a whole lot more in terms of um, your abilities and the monsters' abilities that kind of remove you from like, oh, I am a person hunting down a monster. It's like, no, you're you're doing some crazy shit. 
Like so, um, there's a move with dual blades that turns you into like a <laughs> pinwheel where like you turn into oh, a and you spin down the back. That's in world, right? Oh, no, no, no. So like that's that's also in world, which is it's a, it's a dope move. I wish yeah. that they had incorporated that into the actual rotation like they did in rise that's one of the things that i'm hoping that they bring into the game but anyway um that's not the move that i'm talking about the move that i'm talking about is it's something that comes in sunbreak and allows you to turn into like a drill of uh of a of a person and you uh, like burrow into a monster and then like drop down and it does like a ton of damage or whatever but it's it's stuff like that with the inclin the amplification of the wire bugs that makes you feel as if you are playing the game with handicaps. Whereas with world, you're playing you're playing base. Like it is other than the clutch claw, you are you are fighting this monster exactly with with your me- your weapon, and that's it. There's no assistance so, coming from anything else other than last your question. I promise. Yeah. The new game coming out is it. Uh, war- is it Wilds? You said is that yeah, on top wilds. of World? That's going to be a separate oh, standalone. Yeah, but it's oh, totally new. Be, yeah, yeah, it's going to be. Oh. So this is number six. This is Monster Hunter Six in terms of like the releases. Monster Hunter World was the first like major console release that we had in a while, um, right. and it was its first foray into the high definition uh, yeah. game. They're doing great. it again with six, which is huge. Like a ton of people are excited about it. Uh, is it only PS5 and like the new Xbox or is it PS4? What, I don't know what it's going to come out for on first. Mm. Honestly, I hope it's on PlayStation 5. I'm, I would, I would I hazard just, to guess that I, PC is going to be uh, at least three to six well, months later. Like we just haven't been getting uh, games that are, you know, ignoring the old generation yet. Because the new generation of both consoles have very fast reload times. You can do, like, no load screen situations. Yeah, pretty much. You can have much better games that everyone can enjoy. Absolutely. And so if they do that with the new Monster Hunter. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm really hoping that they do some interesting things with the game mechanics because i know that there are a lot of people who have been like man i would love to see the the crazy like high-end high octane skills that are usually present in the mobile only games which is like rise you have monster hunter cross and stuff like that um in those game styles you see a lot of crazy high-end stuff that doesn't make it into the uh, base games of one through six at this point so i'm eager to see what they do for this next one i really hope they don't bring back the clutch claw because i i feel like it was a bit of a crutch and a lot of the fights became to uh have become so dependent on you using that move to actually even do uh, reliable reliable damage to the monster. So I just hope they yeah. uh, do I insect got good news. That, huh? I've got good news. What? You go to the main website and you go to, I think, Steam or something. Coming in 2025. Oh, my God. That's so long from now. That yeah, so long. long. It, I know. Is it is only PS5, Xbox Series, and Steam. Nice. So it is a oh, completely a new fast. generation Monster Hunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah because, I because it's it's six. Mm. Yeah, it, rise happened in between uh, full, uh, five, which was world. Rise, rise happened and six, so that so that people on what a or wait no, it was for the Nintendo. It was for the new Nintendo. Yeah, yeah, because the they Switch. they started they started in Nintendo, right? Monster Hunter. They Nintendo was a uh, they was um, the main subsidiary. Yes. No. Uh, Major no, uh, Sony. console that they play. Really it's strong. always been Sony. Oh, it's Sony. It's yeah. always been sorry, Sony. Yeah, it's always been on the PlayStation because I I was looking it up and I I originally played Monster Hunter Two on the PlayStation. Oh, okay. yeah. I played but, the Monster they, Hunter Four. Uh, no, three, three. They like specifically four. made a 3DS one, and then they yes. specifically made yeah. Monster Hunter Rise for the. I can't remember the name of it because 3DS Steam one was good. Life now, 3DS one was um, so good. The Switch. <laughs> yeah. the switch one. that was the switch one was rise that's, monster hunter rises for the switch that's the only and that's cross generation they made it yeah yeah 
Oh, yeah. man, I missed that it's game. It's going to be cool. I really hope that Monster Hunter Wilds will have, like, um, you know, you have the city. You always have the city, the town. Hmm. I want that town to be kind of like Path of Exile or, or I don't know, some other game where oh, it yeah. is open world. Everything's open, and the monsters actually can show up and be trying to get into that town that is supposed to be the last bastion of humanity on this uh, island or whatever, you know? Well, with the wilds, it's almost like they're doing... So every single game has been kind of borrowing from uh, different cultures. This one is probably closest to, like, the Western version of the Wild West, I think, in the terms of, like, you're on a mount, and it looks like you're either herding something or you're driving through a herd of something. And... <laughs> In my head, I'm like, oh, you have to do escort quests or something like that, or you're you're doing uh, some form of uh, corralling or capturing that re- re- uh, requires you to lasso a monster and pull it down or something like that. that. Really like, <clears throat> I think there's going to be some really cool pieces where like you use your mount almost as a separate partner that like you'll lasso something up and you'll get off your mount and your mount will keep on pulling it. In a certain yeah. way that allows you to, I don't know, utilize in another fight because maybe it turns into a tug of war with your uh, mount behind something. I don't know. It all, it's interesting. I'm very intrigued with uh, where they're going. There's a lot of there's a lot to pull from the things that they've released. Uh, actually, scratch that. There's not a lot of pull from what they've released. There's like other than the fact that they've given you a mount and there's a herd of things and there's like a wind that goes about that changes the um, layout of the area. There's not a lot. Not a lot of information outside of that. Yeah. I'm very excited for what they're for uh, the release. Whatever they do, I'm going to play it. I don't care. Monster Hunter has been ever since I was. It'll be good no matter what. 20 something. Monster Hunter has been like the game that I'm going to play on release regardless. So I'm very excited for it to come out. This has been hit or miss for me. Uh, There are some of them that I really, really enjoyed. Some Mm -hmm. of them that wasn't. And then some parts at times in my life that just wasn't the game I was looking for. Yeah, I hear you. The idea uh, has always been one of my favorite ideas. And so I'll keep keep trying them out on release. For sure. Yeah, and just to quickly kind of explain myself the i think the request of mine is kind of unique where it's just when i'm in the town and monster hunter mm-hmm. and they're talking about how dangerous it is around here and how 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 scary it is i want to feel that while i'm in the town i feel too safe I, it's okay for me to be safe but i want to feel i want to look over the safe. edge and see the monsters at our like footsteps just like, i i feel like that could cool. be solved very easily by having the town be in an area Where that hunting. you can hunt in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in that area has and its monsters, mm-hmm. but not have it like having the starter area be a part of that initial town. So you're in the town, you're always in the town, but you can see the monsters that spawn in on the map and the monster, like the, the, the dragon, like monsters flying around outside of the town bubble. So like you're still safe, but there's an area that it's in and you can see the monsters there. So the town is within the overworld rather than in a separate hub in one overworld, just the yeah, starting one overworld. overworld. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't even need to be big and yeah. stuff and yeah. make it safer yeah. in the beginning. Yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. You hunt yeah. things in there for they the first also, few hunts. Like, the biggest thing they did kind of weird in monster hunter world was I think you fight Ragnaros or someone, not someone big, Ragnaros. right? Ragnaros. Or maybe it was rise. I don't know, but they're like attacking and they're attacking through your fortifications and they're pushing That's through rise. your That's stuff, rise. right? That's but rise. it's not actually yeah. your town. It yeah. doesn't look like your town at all. It's just like your town it's just all. a random place. So there's no yeah. connection. Yeah. And if they can make that connection, it would just add to the immersion. Absolutely. And I would love that. Absolutely. And and they don't need to do it and it'll still be fun. But if they did do it, they would be fix something that kind of makes a disconnect for me. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'd be down for more innovation. I think that, so uh, oddly enough, I do, Monster Hunter has one of the coolest ideas, but I also think that the user interface, the experience, Terrible. and the, um, the, like how you go about interacting with the game has so much room for improvement too. 
So it's one of those games where I'm like, they can just keep making this. And as long as they keep improving and iteratively making it's it a little bit better, better, and better, it is one yeah. of those genres that people always want to play and it'll always get better. And so that's and always really it'll exciting to too. It'll, pop, it'll get to the point where it'll pop off. Like world was really close. Um, I think again, the UI, as you mentioned, is really hard to get your yeah. mind around. There's yeah. not, oh, uh, not a lot. Of, it's a lot of menus. It's yeah. not very attractive in terms of like getting per- a person involved. However, that being said, I've tried to think about how they're going to renovate that, and it's it's a daunting task because like you have a whole bunch of systems that exist that touch that talk with each other but they do not share a lot of common repositories like your equipment can't your equipment and and your decorations and your um your equipment your decorations and your pouch should operate within the same like uh menu however getting them to actually be individualistic to where you can actually make the the required edits is kind of daunting because then you just have sub menus and sub menus are even worse well, i think i actually have the solution at least for me that if they would add l- recommended loadouts for your gear or m- primarily the materials you bring to an excursion that would help so much because that's where i would burn out was the menu stuff and figuring out what's a setup but when i gave myself a loadout for easy or gathering or medium difficulty or hard where I might have like all of my buffs in my inventory. Mm. If they just had that ready for me to go as a new player, especially I wouldn't have had that burnout. Now Mm. I know since I've experienced it and overcome it, I personally have to go and make those loadouts for a new game every time. And if I make them, I'll be fine. But if I don't, I'll go to the game one day and I'll be like, I don't, want to manage my inventory and i'm not going to play it the same thing happens with me with like stardew valley i love it i get far into it i take a small few weeks break i come back and i'm like there's shit everywhere i don't know what to do here what's the solution (laughs) oh it's in a chest you don't have to go find it you don't have to organize your chests every crafting thing in your farm will just pull from it automatically and i think cow world does that if i if i heard right when i was watching strip and play yeah, it's that, it's just all together. You just problem. you just shove stuff in a chest, yeah. and as long as it as long as it's in your town, yeah. everybody has access to it. And when you're no crafting, it uses that. it. Yeah, that's, that's not fun yeah. for anybody, and it, and it burns you out. Yeah, when you come back, you every every game developer you, that yeah. is like developing a game, and if for some reason they're listening to this podcast, <laughs> like you just have to remember. That people are playing games because the interaction that they are having with this game is enjoyable in some way. And so when you're designing and making games, focus on the interactions that are fun and eliminate interactions that are not fun. Yeah, it's that easy. Yeah. And, And surprisingly, surprisingly, Lego Fortnite has that problem where I started playing it and it's great, but then inventory management hell happens yeah and it's almost okay because at some point it's like oh now that i have all of the crafting things at least so like i have a lot of them like nine of them i'm like okay i can see that i should put a chest by all of them and these things go in that chest but what ruins it is when you have a material that's used on multiple crafting stations and so now it's like well where does that one go it's just fucking pull from the chests in your town and and no one has to freaking have the boring ass game it's, of managing their inventory. Uh, yeah, it's just like the the weight systems in a lot of game games where you you can only carry like 150 pounds or something like that. Right. And then you're exactly. going around and you're picking up stuff and you're picking up everything and you figure out that 90% of your inventory is crap that you're never going to use that is not necessary that isn't needed and is just filling up your weight. Baldur's Gate has this problem in some ways, right? Or Divinity Original Sin 2. Uh, I, those are just the first two come to mind, but a lot of that stuff you're never going to use. So you're just, you have to go through and delete it or manually clean it up. And there's an easy solution. If it isn't useful, if you cannot use it for something, why is it in the game? And mm. Baldur's Great Gate solves this by having just 
like going overboard with it to almost a comedic interesting level where they're like oh yeah you can pick up everything good luck have everything fun everything is right? pickable you and then, dumbass yeah and then you <laughs> and then part of the engagement with the game is determining what is trash and what is not trash and that becomes interesting but essentially you have to go one of two ways you have to go the Baldur's Gate 3 path where everything that figuring out what you need to pick up is part of the puzzle or you need to go to the path where everything that you pick up is interesting and usable. That way, when you run out of weight space, you have to decide between two things that matter. And that decision has like implications to it that make it interesting of like, shit, I need a lot of stone or I need a lot of wood. I can't carry all of them. And I have to go back to town, which is going to do X, Y, and Z and take a lot of time. And if I go back now, like now you have to think about it. That extra step of like interest level makes it interesting. But I hate oh, hate it whenever two games. Things. One, there's a balance of having a limit to how much of a crafting material you can pick up. Yeah. And having like a sleep mechanic and having survival mechanics agreed, and, agreed. and eating mechanics that can be enjoyable in, in a way having certain limitations can be enjoyable but the biggest one that you brought up that is terrible is getting is not being able to get rid of shit lego <laughs> fortnite you can't just delete something you have to throw a bunch of useless shit all over the place until it despawns valheim i'm pretty sure still doesn't let you delete things you have to eventually craft the thing yeah. that deletes things yeah that's annoying what? i hate True. that hey, uh, it's so, oh, it's mm -hmm. stardew valley has a delete button that you drag it to the <laughs> trash like I, come on i'm pretty sure i've seen a youtube video where a group of guys built a giant uh like had a giant pit or cliff near them in Valheim and it was their trash cliff and they would just throw stuff off. Bro. <laughs> and so annoying. Take it what? to the trash It is cliff. so simple and easy to have a delete button or delete trash can in the inventory. Yeah. And they don't do it. That's this is this is game development 101. Why would why are you torturing us? Because why? it makes I think funny. it's an oversight. I, I honestly think it it's an funny. oversight. I I think it's uh, initial planning oversight, but I would argue that 90% of the time, they're developing this in the right way. And then once they think about that problem, they've designed the system wrong. And that's probably yeah. what happens. So they start mm. the game and they're like, okay, we need an inventory. Cool. Code an inventory. Awesome. Okay, we need this combat thing and we need some weapons and equipment. Okay, code those things. Okay, we need these enemies and those enemies need to have items and they hook it up and they're like, oh, well, to have the enemies have items, we need to make them like persistent in a few different ways. Cool, get it done. Okay, now we have enemies with items that you can kill that drop that you can put in your inventory. And then they're like, cool, all those systems are good. And then some developers playing it, man, like, man, there's a lot of shit. Let's add a delete button <laughs> for the inventory. Man, and, their, and their lead developer is like, eh. We can't delete stuff. Are you crazy? That'll break everything. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I, I think it's like on one hand, yes, I consider that oversight. But on another hand, I think the process that I just explained happens over like a year of minor yeah. changes. And then when they get to the point where they're like, oh, now we're having a problem where we need to delete stuff. They're like, crap, that's going to be like uh, a few hundred man hours of work to redesign our inventory oh, system uh, so that it, we can do that. And at that point, they're like, uh, fucking work on the other stuff first. We'll get to that at some point. Like, that's... <laughs> Oh, and honestly, we're kind of being pedantic over that. Like, regardless of whether we hate the inventory deletion system of Valheim or not, has it stopped Valheim but from being one of the most successful early access absolutely games not. ever made? No, absolutely not. So it's obviously not a big enough issue for them to waste some amount of time on it. We just don't we don't have a clear insight as to what the time investment is to like fix that as a feature, you know. And so that's the that's the thing. Now, I would say if it's a design intention by the Valheim team, I would argue that's like a weird, bad design. But I, I have a feeling that most of the time that is not the case. Just like most of the UI and UX for Monster Hunter, I would argue is kind of like the Nats point. A lot of the bad designs or bad mechanics from it had mm -hmm. design intent of why they were that way. 
And those systems, they're copy pasting those systems so they can build on those systems with every game rather than having to redesign the system for every game because 99% of their time for each game needs to be spent on making their monsters. Monster creation in those games is a nightmarish undertaking with hundreds of thousands of hours, I would argue, into like making them feel real, making them interesting, doing their move sets, animating them, rigging them, like making sure that everything that every weapon possibility and combo works. And then also making sure that all those fights are fun, interesting, and with the design intent that they have, like huge. They're like, dude, don't waste our time on the inventory. Like people have been dealing with that shit for 20 years, Yeah, right? As long as the fights are fun enough, the time investment they do in the interfaces doesn't matter really. Yeah. And now that we've brought it back to Monster Hunter, and that was there anything else that you played? Did you guys play any like couch co-op games or anything in the past? I haven't, you know, played, or... sh- I haven't played shit, my guy. Y'all didn't Mel's even play we, like rounds or anything? We, we, played, play we, played we played yeah. we played board games. We played board games. Yeah, we oh, played yeah. a few. Board I didn't games. play a single digital game all together. No. 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 What? I was busy, dude. <laughs> well, he was. <laughs> he was busy. He was busy. Okay, okay. I went to work, I came home, wait a, and I wait a second. Hook. Anthony, uh, did we play a single digital board game while I was with you? We did. We played World of Warcraft. We did. We had our LAN party that yeah, the females did. refused to join us on. It, we wow. did. That's correct. <laughs> Truly unfortunate. Yeah. Truly unfortunate. But no, we didn't do... do uh, we didn't get deep into the... Uh, what did you think of that storyboard game? Which one? Where you built your story. Like you had to... Oh, the, um, dude, it's long. It is. <laughs> it is long. And if you well, are and, not... And uh, Nat played a special version of that, by the way. It was yeah. a little bit more interesting than the, the to us, probably, than the one you played, Anthony, because the one he played was Brandon Sanderson specific. So if you've read all the Brandon Sanderson novels like we have, me and Nat were sitting there like, dude, it's the thing. <laughs> Like every other card, we're like, oh, that's that's this. And so it was it had a lot of like cool tie ins. Um, But I think our experience might have been um, marred a little bit by uh, Mel not enjoying the experience too much. Oh, yeah, she was she she shared that on Instagram and uh, Eric's wife reposted it and I saw it. And I thought Eric's wife was saying, I hate this game. And I was like, wait a second. When she was here, she's the one who wanted to play it. I thought, that's that's I thought her favorite Eric's game. I love this game. And yeah, I was just so confused. I was like, I was like, I go and ask my wife. I was like, I thought Bon V wanted to play this. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, Not look, dude. it's it's a repost. Yeah. It's a repost. Yeah. I was like, repost. No, that is. There was, <laughs> yeah, it that, was a, it was an experience of there are certain games that can be played during the week involving my wife and myself with the level of energy that we have during that time. That was not <laughs> a game that we could fully engage with <clears throat> knowing that we had to work tomorrow. Yeah. I think if it, maybe if it wasn't for the point system, maybe you would have enjoyed it more because that's the only thing I don't care about for that game. In that game, it basically has a lot of people have played uh, Seven Wonders. Where you have a point oh, system have that depends that. on yeah, a bunch yeah. of other random different things, and there's completely different ways to do it. You can do science, or you can do whatever, and that can be fun for people. But it, but it's also just a lot of advanced math. It's all just so, advanced math and statistics, and that to me isn't necessarily a relaxing and enjoyable. You might, experience. you might love the version we played, though, Anthony, because the version that we played didn't. You didn't use the point system. We had yeah, a boss, yeah, yeah. and we all had to work together to beat the boss. And whoever beat the bots, you boss, know, uh, what's the name of this game? Tipped off the we've been talking about call, call to adventure. Call to adventure for those listening. <laughs> Valid. A call Valid. to adventure. <laughs> so uh, essentially, just to kind of explain it, it's a, it's a great game. Um, uh, essentially, you have a character and you're building their story. They have a past. You like draw three cards, the past, present, and future, essentially. And yeah. then you go in and you do little challenges by rolling runes to kind of overcome challenges. 
in the version that I played with Anthony, which my wife, this is my wife's favorite board game. So uh, we've played it a good deal now. The version that we played with Anthony was the base version. In the base version, you're trying to just get the most amount of points. Whoever builds the quote unquote best story gets the most points and wins the game for the night. In the version Damn. I played with Nat. Well, before you go there, I must say that in the version I played, there's a good and evil system. Mm -hmm. And you kind of start, I think you start a little bit good, not even neutral. You're all a little yeah, bit good. Yeah. And the Just most one fun thing. and hilarious part of our game session was that my wife would not let me become evil. <laughs> that was she, funny. And she had the ability to prevent me from being a bad she was like no no you're a good boy you're gonna be a good boy today you're gonna be and i'm like i don't yeah. know i'm tempted by this sword i'm gonna try yeah. and get that sword she's like no you're a good person you're a good boy yeah don't and she actually kind of screwed me, screwed me by yeah, she me did a good she boy. did <laughs> i was like i can't use this card now why'd you do that oh, it's like that's pretty funny you're a good boy <laughs> But yeah, so because you're a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you have She's some interesting mechanics like that. that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the the one that I played with Nat was a special edition of the game that specifically mm. has to do with building characters in the Brandon Sanderson Cosmere universe. Same game, but there is a big bad guy in the Cosmere, and mm. they have bad guy cards in the game. And so with that addition, they created a co-op system where the big bad guy has its own card. And at the end of the game, you all, instead of ending your turn, right after you take your final turn, you have to fight the big boss challenge. And he has a certain amount of HP. The more you complete the challenge by, deals damage. So he's a challenge level of nine. You have to roll a nine or above to complete the challenge. And every point you go above, you deal damage to his health. If you together do not kill him and take away all his HP at the end of the game, you all lose. It's bullshit. Wow. So wait, did y'all get to like collect shard blades yeah. and, and shard yeah. plate? Yeah. You did? Yes. Oh, uh, it oh was, that's cool. It was super cool. It was, it was cool. a very fun twist on the call to adventure. Wait. Wait, did y'all have the spells? Like, like the I don't remember kind what they're of. called because I haven't. Like kind the of. the lashings. Did y'all have lashings? Yeah, kind no. of, kind no. of. They no. th so they had w no. we had a challenge card called the second lashing. Oh, okay, that's yeah, cool. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So it wasn't okay. like you got to do a lashing, but there was there were cards. Oh, there were like part of the adventure. yes. Yeah, where you're like, ah, the second lashing. You, so, you overcome the second lashing and stuff like that. Does that, does that mean that y'all weren't like lightborn or what is it called? Everybody, everybody was a different radiant. We got, to, radiant. we got to choose what our radiant was at the beginning of the game. Wait, sorry, is that one of the nine? Or yeah, is it nine? one of yeah. the um, different radiant, knight's radiant. Yeah, yeah. From... From the very, like, not the first book necessarily, but the book where they all decide to stop going back to hell, basically. But only one is there. Is that what we're That's talking the about? the Way of Kings. Way of Kings. How much have you read of the Way of Kings, Anthony? Not enough. Oh, buddy. Eric, I'm going to leave that to you, bud. <laughs> you <laughs> I've, been I've been trying for years. I've been trying for years. It's book a I'm reading. It's a book. Nice. It's a big book. It's it is a big, a big book. book. So good. Wait, have you read any of the other Brandon Sanderson universe books? Um, maybe a little bit, but I went back to the way of Kings cause I was enjoying it. Uh, hey dude, I, that, yeah, I will say it's an interesting, the, the way of Kings is like a fine wine. If you come back to it after reading some of the other stuff, it's even it's better good. because, it's true. but I will say I also started with the way of Kings and I loved it even knowing none of the secret hints that they're giving you in the books. But mm. when you go and read his other stuff and come back, you're going to be like, holy shit, that was in this book. Holy shit, they referenced this, right? And that's such a cool experience. It's it's mm. good enough to where I fully recommend reading the entirety of The Way Kings because that's how I started, and I think that's the best book to start with. But I will say that if you read it first, you will have to read it again after you come back and read everything else because it'll change the way you think about it. 
when you read it a second time after knowing all the information, which is really cool. That's, that's my favorite kind of book. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's amazing exactly. enough to make you read it through, but then the rereadability is insane. Yes. Okay. And that's what I want. So yeah. to wrap this, my friends, oh. your suggestion, the thing that you're offering for your end, is that the way of kings? Or are you saying that the, what, what is the one thing that you were wanting to kind of like give to people to be like, hey, you should really check this out. Oh, yeah. The, the Brandon Sanderson Cosmere is amazing. Uh, mm. Definitely worth a read. He's my favorite author. I'm biased. Um, a lot of people say he's basic, but I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. I, I have a hard time reading books. Okay. I'm that person. And A Way of Kings, I think, has a good hook. It oh yeah absolutely it, it makes me want to read it you want to absolutely. know one of the coolest aspects of the book and this doesn't spoil anything but it's a cool idea of the book every single stormlight archive book you remember the opening prologue uh, the mm-hmm. um, uh, the, 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 the prologue where he comes Not in he didn't die. And... No, 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 no. Sorry, not the prologue. Chapter one or whatever it oh, is. Oh, you're talking about where the guy's going in as an assassin yes. for the new treaty? Yes. Yeah. The house shit prologue. Good. So, every, so good. every Stormlight Archive book, you get to experience that story from a different perspective as the first chapter to every book. Yep. Because that event triggers everything it's everything I, and i like the introduction for it for yeah. for Way of kings because the guy it, it your introduction is from the point of view of the assassin and he's like why are they even having me do this yeah. this is insane this is crazy but here i go Ooh, maybe this guy will be able to kill me damn it yeah he's a, again he, seth, seth is a cool character i like him it's a great series, series. well worth yeah, reading yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll share a little bit more. My problem was I switched to doing uh, Way of Kings as my like go to bed nighttime audible, and eventually I realized that's not a good idea. There's too much. I can't. It's hefty. I can't. I have to like. Re- it's, it's, so I have to read it, and I'm using it as a book that'll help me develop a reading habit. Nice, nice. I will I say my my wife just uh, finished a Launtress which is one of his other books in the Cosmere and has moved on to Warbreaker, which are both um, really, really good as mm-hmm. well. Nice little intro. Anthony, what you got? About what? What are you uh, giving our listeners as a thing to uh, pay attention, like to tune into? Oh, cool. yeah, oh. Yeah. oh, shit. Uh, not Reacher. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's apparently some good crime. books that are written for reacher and and reacher the season one amazon prime show i mean it's really be a book is really gr- is really great for uh this like intimidating big guy season one's amazing season two guess what they did they skipped to book 10 wow. for season two which feels horrible because suddenly the scale is different. It, it's a very different formula. There's all these people that you don't care about, but are suddenly in the mix. And, and if they would have done a slow build up to season 10, it would have been great. Or sorry. Yeah. It, like book 10 season, whatever, but they've, they've skipped and, and the writers are terrible bad in certain circumstances. They're really good at the really, it's like Pacific Rim. They're really good at showing big, roided up guy that's intimidated, intimidating, and a force of justice, you know, destroy the evil around you. But um, the girl grabs a thumb drive, right? There's a thumb drive scene, and she grabs her laptop and goes, I don't have this port. I'm going to have to go get it. And her fucking laptop has a million stickers on it. And she's the tech person. I'm sorry. That's rough. She's going to know immediately. She doesn't need to look at her freaking laptop to verify like she's 70 years old. It ruined it. (laughs) <laughs> don't watch reacher season two watch reacher season one and enjoy that and never go back so your suggestion right. is reacher one yeah reacher season one reacher one okay. and stop 
Okay. Creature. Got you. <laughs> One. I got. I got it's you. So great. The fight scenes are great. The female actress is great. The other, like the male, he's is. Uh, it's it's good. good. It's good. There are some. There's some. Eh, but there's a lot of good. There's more good than. Eh. Okay. <sighs> anyway. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Reacher season one was good for you. Good to know, yeah. my guy. And, and what's, you. what's her name was in the Fall of the House of Usher too. I was like, I know this girl from somewhere. Um, but she did really good. The female lead from Reacher, the the cop girl, also played in, one in of the main characters one. in the Fall of the House of Usher. Yeah, in season one. Mm. Yeah, like it's one of those things where we're watching season two and we're like, we miss her. So oh, much, damn. you know, oh, damn. and and it's just like, uh, it's heartbreaking. So oh, Nat, Nat, what are you giving to our uh, listeners? You need to watch The Creator. It's on Hulu. It's really good. Um, is it a movie? Is it a show? It is a movie. It's a movie. Huh? It's a singular movie. It was shot on a very slim budget, but I would argue to say that it is the definitive sci-fi movie to watch before Dune. What? Yeah, really well done. Wait, Uh, did you watch Dune? Of course I watched Dune. For some reason, I thought last time we talked, you hadn't watched Dune. No, I've watched Dune. I've watched and read Dune. Don't worry. <laughs> I had I had read Dune, but I finally saw Dune over the Christmas break with Anthony. <laughs> Thank you for educating him. But yeah, um, it is a story based on humanity. Well, not, not even humanity. It's the Americas waging a, a war against AI and AI existing within a um, sovereign state, like in something that's called New Asia. And New Asia supports the existence of, of uh, AI as a separate existence and treats them as humans. Hmm. So it is the story of a super weapon developed by uh, the creator of the AI to battle this um, newfound stigma against AI. Nice. You have to watch it. It's good. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It's fantastic. Oh, huh. oh cool. What are we, when are we doing this next there, boys? Yeah, I think we're, tomorrow. No, 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 probably not tomorrow. tomorrow. But no, um, not tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I think maybe next weekend, I, like we should do it again. Uh, and we'll we'll get another episode out for y'all. Um, but with with that, we'll conclude episode seven. Episode seven. Episode seven. That was a long one. Yeah, that was a long was one. Seven. Oh, thank you, because my notes are off by one. Oh no, that was episode Buddy. seven. I got I got them all. But Buddy. yeah, everybody have a good week, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace. Peace.